not too handy or too handsome But I sure do like to play some When I can be the fool Lose the plot and lose my cool I lose my keys but not my conscience Tell me do you really want this Tell me why, 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 why you won't go I've tried, 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 tried to let it show Well, I've been to the bottom and back So many times that I simply lost track I think I get my living. Think I get my living. This time, 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 time. Think I get my living. Think I get my living this time. I've been trying to take it easy. Take it easy, but still take it. Make it better if I break it. Sometimes that gets hard If I slip to older ways The poorer plans of darker days And need a shoulder or a friend I hope I see you then Tell me why Well, good morning, everybody, on this Tuesday morning. Welcome to Real Talk. I'm Ryan Jesperson. That's Ayla Brooke and the Sound Men. And Sam Brooks, who, who continues to, to fine-tune, Sam's the technical producer of this show, fine-tune and tweak good morning. our dissolved intro. I like that. You waited until we got into the... I, I, well, I mean, you were having a sip of coffee. A little so, whammy bar. Yeah. <laughs> I actually would have been okay if you would have, if you would have brought me up... Um, uh, I was going to say au naturel, but that might sound like I was in my birthday suit as opposed to simply you making myself jacket on vulnerable quickly. in front of you all. Uh, it would have been okay if you would have, have shown me hitting up my coffee here. How about that tweet from Michael Parker? You saw this one that we got. Just, <laughs> I got this late last night. This was amazing. Out of nowhere. Jasperson, I have the coffee. I've set it extra early. I plan to have half a pot down by 8.30. Failed vaccine, failed pipe, failed jobs, failed economy. All Albertans, stolen pension funds. Shit, out of characters. See you at 8.30. I'm ready. Release the hounds, says Michael Parker. So we're ready to go. So maybe we better do exactly that. We're going to be talking about coal mining today. You're going to go, you've been talking about coal mining for the... Yeah, but the story keeps changing, right? Yesterday at like 10 to 5 p.m., Alberta's energy minister, Sonia Savage, says, hey, we're, 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 hey, we're walking back 11 of these coal leases. And everybody goes, whoa. And then everybody says, hang on a second. Hang on. Just wait. It's but a small percentage of what we're actually talking about. We thought, you know what we need to do? We need to reach out to two people that can, that can cut through all of this. Right? We're not going to solve everything on Twitter. We're not going to ever figure everything out on the World Wide Web. We need to bring in some experts that monitor these stories. So we're going to do exactly that. Jam-packed show in store. We're going to check in with a lawyer down in Dallas, Texas. We're going to talk about the president, the outgoing, not the incoming, of the United States expected to continue a, a spree of pardons, Donald Trump is. They say up to 100 pardons. Uh, people are wondering if that's going to include people that were part of that, uh, that act of domestic terror against the Capitol, that attempted coup on January 6th. We're going to find out. Eric Cidio will join us. And we're going to talk about a post-COVID workplace, how trends are going to change with regards to working from home, downtown real estate. We're going to get into it. Plus, emails from you. You have not, like, you're stomping on the gas, real talkers, which is great. 
Uh, you've you've not you've not indicated any desire to stop talking about issues that matter to you and keeping us in the loop, which means that we're just going to keep bringing them to the forefront. And I hope that's okay with you. Bitcoin Well is the team that makes this possible each and every morning. Is our title sponsor. 2021, I mean, let me say the last three months of 2020 into 2021, if you pay attention to crypto, you know what it's looked like, right? And then, and then, if you want to make sense of it, try to figure out where it's going. Talk to the team that knows what's up, the team that's keeping an eye on this. 40 people strong based out of Edmonton. Bitcoin Well is the safest and easiest way for you to buy and sell Bitcoin. You can check them out online. And check out CEO Adam O'Brien's new line of clothing. I love it. It's called Told You So. (laughs) Well done. All right, let's get rocking. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. All right, so news breaks uh, right around quitting time, uh, right around 5 o'clock yesterday. The Alberta government, uh, by way of Energy Minister Sonia Savage, a release indicating that they're going to walk back 11 of these coal leases that everybody's been talking about. We're going to get to this in just a second, but I want to show you a trend. Uh, Sam, let's get to the tweet that I sent out. I pushed this tweet out uh, right around the time that everybody was talking about it. Emma Graney does an amazing job. Uh, She reports, okay, so after immense public pressure, the Alberta government's canceled 11 recent coal leases. So I go, oh, yeah, right on. I was sitting in a parking lot at the time. I went, oh, yeah, right on. So I tweet power to the people. Like, well done, everybody. Uh, with you know immense public pressure, right? Power to the people. Right away. People like MP. And I'm not taking a swipe. I'm not taking a swipe at all. Don't get me wrong. Folks like MP are like, no, don't fall for it. She says this is a pretend response to public outcry. It means nothing, says MP. Keep the pressure on these guys. All right, so let's do it. Uh, David Kahn joins us out of the gates this morning. David is uh, an energy lawyer, constitutional lawyer as well. Of course, former leader of the Alberta Liberal Party. Dave, welcome to the show and thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, Ryan. So this is the response, and I saw it on mass. I I could show you about 100 tweets from people saying, don't lay off the gas, keep on it, keep on them. This is nothing. This is a tiny little portion. You know, this is smoke and mirrors. You know what's going on here. What is it? Well, I think as uh, as you and others maybe characterized it later in the evening when we we dug into it a little more, it's really a a bait and switch, switch or... Smoke and mirrors, really, they've canceled the last 11 leases, which represents about 0.12% of the uh, leases that they've uh, that they've leased recently. So as Laurie Adkin uh, pointed out on Twitter, so it's really just a, a minuscule amount of uh, of the lease of the coal leases that they've already uh, leased out. And it's really just to distract us. And it really caught a lot of people. It, it, it actually, uh, you know, convinced a lot of people that they'd really had a real reversal here. Okay, so let's take a look at the maps. Uh, I want to credit uh, the CBC's Robson Fletcher for pushing these ones out. Yeah. Um, this will give people an idea or an understanding of what we're talking about. So the gray is where coal leases exist, right? And the black is the 11 that were walked back last night. So it gives you a sense of, of the magnitude of what's out there and the significance of what was pulled back. Here's an even bigger picture. The, the Category 2 lands that we're talking about, David, you can maybe take us into this here. People can see the blue there on the map on the right. This is the especially sensitive area of Alberta's Rocky Mountain Parkland, correct? Yeah, yeah. So you see the blue there. That's Category 2. Category 1 is the uh, the pink there. Of course, that's all mostly national parks. So uh, no, no, no uh, UCP, uh, you know, has no credit uh, in, in preserving that area. But the blue area was not, was was protected until June 1st of last year. And now it's open for uh, for coal mining and min- and much of it's been leased out now. Okay, so David, where do you land on all of this? Like, what's the significance of those eleven that were that the government hit pause on yesterday? And what do you think that represents with regards to the bigger picture conversation, which is what people want to have? I mean, I was hearing from people last night, time and time and time again, saying we will not be happy until at minimum Lahid's policy is restored. Is that what you'd be calling for? Well, yes. I mean, that policy was was uh, rescinded in the dead of night on a, a Friday evening of the long weekend with no uh, public consultation whatsoever with First Nations, with ranchers, with municipalities or anyone. And that's what's protecting those Category 2 lands from uh, strip mining in our very sensitive eastern slopes and, and uh, 
and can pr produce severe pollution for our headwaters. So yeah, I think the, the, the first step needs to be a good faith uh, reapplication of that policy and some real consultation with Albertans. People, I think, are, are going to want to make sure that they have a complete understanding of what's going on here. If nothing else, one of the things I've been really encouraged by over the last week or so is that more and more citizens are waking up to this and people want to educate themselves, David. So so you have, a, I think, a pretty good sense of, of what's happening. And I won't say necessarily behind the scenes, but, but at least developments that aren't winding up on the front page of the paper or the lead story on newscasts. I mean, there's there's indigenous groups. There's people that are put, you know, taking legal avenues here to to uh, certainly influence government perspective and, and ultimately policy. Uh, can you pull back the curtain? I mean, can you give us a sense of what's going on? Yeah, definitely. So uh, a ranchers group uh, uh, late last year or uh, well uh, in the fall uh, filed a judicial review application to have the court review the government's rescinding of the 1976 coal policy. And then uh, in November, two different sets of First Nations, uh, two in Treaty 6 and two in Treaty 7, brought their own judicial reviews on, uh, on, uh, 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 on the basis of a lack of consultation and infringement of their uh, treaty and Aboriginal rights. So uh, now the Alberta uh, government's brought a motion to strike the ranchers case on the basis that they, the cabinet can do whatever it wants and it could rescind the policy and the uh, regional plans didn't require them to consult. Uh, and uh, they've also brought an application to merge all three together into one hearing. So my understanding is today the court is potentially hearing the motion to strike. They have a hearing in the ranchers case today. And uh, but it, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a number of interveners intervening in the ranchers case and maybe intervening in the First Nations uh, cases. So uh, it, it's it's fairly complex and there's uh, a, a, a number of different uh, hearings or do applications going on. It, ultimately, what what could be the result? I mean, if, if you could characterize in layperson's terms, so 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 those of us that don't practice law could understand it. What are these First Nations and, and ranchers looking for? I mean, what are they calling for? How how extreme of, of, of an action are they looking for? Well, they're asking the court to uh, issue an order uh, striking down the decision to rescind the coal policy. So reversing that government decision on on uh, on the basis of a lack of consultation and a, a breach of the law, a breach of the regional plans uh, and, and a breach of uh, Section 35 uh, constitutional rights on the on the part of uh, First Nations. So there's there's the, the request from these groups that you're talking about. And I think from the general public, uh, Sam, can, can we actually bring up some of the tweets that people were sending me? David, just to give you a sense of I mean, I th there was tons. Um, I just pulled a few at random to give you a sense of what people were saying. These this, this is what people were contacting us with uh, last night. Jason said, you know, they always intended to back down from this issue. Coal mining in the eastern slopes was always a loser from a business and political sense. It was also a useful distraction from other issues, pension theft, COVID-19 failure, etc. cetera. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this uh, from an outdoors group, Bragg Creek, Kananaskis country, it says removing 11 coal leases from the hundreds located in Category 2 lands isn't what we want. We want an immediate reinstatement of Lougheed's coal policy that banned virtually all open pit mining in Category 2 lands. Uh, this one from Roxanne uh, Dautremont says uh, those mine proposals already before regulators like Grassy Mountain are not affected by this. Eyes forward, folks. There it is again, right? Roxanne says there's only 11, only Category 2. It's progress, but don't blink. It seems like people are, are waking up on this. It seems like people are kind of, you know, I mean, even people that before, if you would have, you know, myself included, David, if you would have said, you know, what, what's the difference between or, you know, what are similarities between open pit or strip mining or traditional or like we wouldn't know. We'd have no idea what's a category one or category two or category three land. I don't know. That's not my line of work type thing. Now, people are people are educating themselves. Do you see this going further? The public demand than simply calling for reinstating a policy that was in place for 50 years. Oh, definitely. I mean, people are waking up to this government's deceit and, and lies and uh, obfuscation and lack of consultation. And, and really, Mr. Kenny, I think, has really lost a lot of his political capital over the last few months. And people are really waking up and they don't believe it when the government says X, Y or Z and they really dig into it. And I really want to credit, uh, you, you know, uh, popular country music stars like Corb Lund and Paul Brandt, Katie Lang, Jan Arden for for speaking out on this issue and really bring it to the public's attention. And it's it's really a testament to how important our, our wild spaces and our our headwaters and our, our water supply is to uh, Albertans from across the political spectrum, urban, rural, 
maybe lean more conservative, more progressive. Uh, you know, everyone's, uh, you know, so uh, most Albertans are really up in arms about this uh this decision and this and this pattern of uh, conduct by this government. Yeah, uh, we we've, we've got uh, just an unbelievable amount of emails. I'm going to try to read a few to give you a sense. And a lot of them, you know, I thought of this. I like I don't suspect that someone like Jason Kenney will lose much sleep over. Uh, an NDP voter or an Alberta Liberal voter or an Alberta Party voter uh, telling him that they think he's he's doing a lousy job. But I think when people start talking about, I donated to your campaign, I knocked doors for you, uh, I'm a UCP member, and I'm pretty ticked off, those are the ones that I think will get the attention of the government. And, and people are CCing us on these aren't these aren't people with, you know, with bluster rolling into our live comment line on YouTube. These are people emailing the premier and CCing our show. And I'm, I'm talking... I wouldn't even say dozens. I'd say there's hundreds of them, uh, which is remarkable. So I feel like we have kind of a front row seat to watch it all. Uh, what else have you been paying? I would imagine, you know, you're, you, you've you been practicing law this entire time. As mentioned, you, you were also involved in politics, leading uh, a party that that frankly has has struggled to, I think, regain the support that it saw in, in the 1990s or whatever. You stepped away from that leadership role. But you seem to, this is my anecdotal observation, <laughs> you seem to be a little bit, maybe there's a similarity, David, between you and I, in, in transitioning out of something into something else, you seem to have dropped some shackles. And, and on social media, you're, I, I have to say, you're much more entertaining now than you used to be on social media. <laughs> you, you approach your social media with a flamethrower these days. Is, is that intentional or what's going on? Well, I guess, yeah. I mean, I'm sort of unshackled from my uh, my political role and 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 the requirement to uh, you know weigh party policy and maybe uh, walk a little uh, more softly. And so I think my personality is coming out a bit more. And I just you know I still have opinions. I still care deeply and, and love my city and province. And 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 I want to see uh, things done right. And I hate to see mistakes made, especially with the bungling of this COVID response and how many people are dying unnecessarily so yeah i mean i, I just uh I, I do enjoy uh being able to be uh a little more uh direct i guess on uh on my social media well listen i'm gonna i'm gonna be checking you with the canadian parks and wilderness society to talk more to dig more into the coal maps and the leases can if i can pick your brain on a few things politically i think people would be interested to hear from you um you talk about the bungling of the covid19 response i know that the alberta government right now the messaging is hey listen um, you know, they've been leading the nation in vaccinations. Uh, there are some numbers that are unflattering to Alberta, certainly. Uh, one of the areas that Alberta's been doing really well, and I think it's a credit to the frontline workers, is getting people their first round of vaccines. Uh, the premier saying the other day that Alberta's about to run out. In other words, we need more. They're shining the light back on the feds. When you say the bungling, uh, what are you referring to? Well, we have one of the highest uh, rates of active infections per uh, 100,000 people in Canada, I think the third highest right now. Uh, and just the mixed messaging all through this. I mean, we were told to stay home, then we were told to travel uh, or, or encouraged to travel. Uh, Kenny resisted bringing in uh, restrictions when the second wave was spiking in the fall and continued to ignore the warning signs and then was forced to bring in restrictions just before Christmas. Uh, you know, the, 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 the messaging about data, we say that the contact tracing uh, uh, collapsed in the, in the fall, uh, and that's why we don't have data about uh, community spread from businesses. But then in the next breath, we're told that uh, there's no data to, to suggest schools and, and, uh, and kids are uh, vectors of transmission and community spread. So it's just really confusing to follow. Uh, there's a lot of, of uh, as I said, mixed messaging and, and things that just aren't uh, internally consistent in, in the way that they're uh, interpreting or communicating the science. And I think uh, Albertans are rightly frustrated. Uh, as for vaccines, you know, I, I do give them credit that we're uh, top of the list in terms of uh, getting vaccines into arms. But, uh, you know, the un what the un un unhelpful rhetoric is blaming the federal government for uh, a delay of the uh, Pfizer uh, shipments when that's due to uh, uh, a, a factory expansion in, in Belgium that we all know that's the reason. So to, to uh, be blaming uh, Ottawa for that in one breath and then asking for help uh, from Ottawa on, on lobbying Biden on Keystone XL. I mean, I just don't get how uh, Mr. Kenny can't turn down the uh, the Ottawa bashing for one day when, uh, uh, you know, given the circumstances. David, I'm going to be talking to Punita McBrien in the 10 o'clock hour. She's just taken the gig as uh, executive director of the Downtown Business Association. We'll talk about like commercial real estate, um, working from home, how, how people's I think really how uh, in some people there's going to be a dramatic alteration to their work or personal life post pandemic that that I think will remain. 
Um, people have have new ways of approaching. I mean, geez, we could, we could do a whole week on this. Uh, what's something that you've taken? Uh, and I'm asking the question broad and general on purpose uh, out of this that that really got you thinking, whether it's political policy or something else o- over the course of these past you know ten months or so. Well, you know, I started speaking out in March uh, for a universal basic income. Of course, that's not the first time we had it in our platform. I mean, I've been uh, really passionate about that issue for years, uh, you know, along with with people like Andrew Yang, who ran for uh, the presidency. And uh, and so in March, I spoke out about the need for a a temporary emergency UBI. Uh, Basically, the federal government, by the time they were finished with uh, tinkering and and expanding CERB, it basically became that. And I think that what's that what's that shown is that as a society, we really need a program like a universal basic income so people don't fall through the cracks so that uh, it isn't a Charles Dickens story for half the population every time there's a pandemic or a crisis. And there will be. There will be credit crises. There will be another pandemic. We need to be prepared as a society to make sure that people have a, a base and they're not uh, falling onto the streets because they lose their job and there's no uh, proper social program. So I'm really passionate about uh, universal basic income and uh uh, to, to, to make sure that Canadians are supported through thick and thin and, and that they know that the, that the government will be there to, to catch their fall if they're affected by something out of their control. David, I know you got a bolt and, and so do I. I've got somebody else uh, set to go here in our, in our uh, green room lounge. It's very luxurious here at Real Talk. The Absolutely. Mimosas and fresh croissant. Um, but uh, if there's one thing I know about you, uh, that's not true. I don't know why I introed it like that. But I do happen to know that Bill One, I don't know why I'm laughing. It's not funny. Uh, Bill One has been grinding your gears for a long time. Uh, this is essentially the, I don't know if I'm being overly or under dramatic, the bill that essentially squashes people's right to protest. I mean, it's it's kind of a, it's a little draconian, to be honest. Uh, and I know that this is something that you've been paying keen attention to because you and I have messaged about this. Uh, take us into this before we say goodbye. Well, yeah, I mean, Bill 1 is called the Critical Infrastructure Defense Act, ostensibly. Uh, it's modeled on a bill uh, written by the American Legislative Exchange and, uh, uh, Council, which is a Republican-funded uh, sort of uh, uh, astroturf organization that writes bills for Republican state legislatures and, and the federal Republicans that they can copy and just pass. So a number of uh, uh, Republican and even Democrat-controlled states have passed this uh, this similar law that's uh, provided to them a la carte from Alec in Washington. So uh, Mr. Kenny's done the same thing, but of course he couldn't he couldn't uh, he couldn't turn down the, the chance to vastly expand uh, this model bill and add def- uh, highways and uh, and if you drill down the definition of highways from the Provincial Highway Traffic Safety Act includes sidewalks, your grandma's back alley public square. Uh, so, so really criminalizing uh, protests just about anywhere, uh, not just on rail lines or, or uh, on pipeline routes. And the government's left it sitting there, proclaimed and not used. And uh, the uh, AUP has challenged it in court. Now the Alberta government is saying, oh, th- th- this uh, judicial review or this challenge is, is uh, unnecessary because uh, uh, it hasn't been uh, used yet. So it's, it's sort of hanging like a sort of Damocles above uh, activists and all Albertans uh, and people are scared that at any time they could be charged under Bill 1 for having a protest on a sidewalk, for example. So uh, I think it's really concerning and it's a, it's a, a real insurgence of, of uh, U.S. Trumpian uh, uh, GOP politics into Alberta and, and I think it has no place and I think it'll be found unconstitutional eventually. It's just, uh, you know, someone's probably going to have to be charged and go through all that stress of a court case before it's found to be unconstitutional. All right, David, thanks for making time to talk to us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. Dave Kahn, uh, an energy and constitutional lawyer uh, practicing out of Calgary. Uh, why don't we just roll into our next interview? I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that uh, that we have an opportunity here to connect. This is have, the comments that we're getting uh, right now on our on our YouTube thread are, are worth getting into. I'm going to get to those in just a second. But Katie Morrison's been able to make time for us out of uh, CPAWS, uh, Southern Alberta. You know that the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, the Southern Alberta chapter. Katie, good morning. Welcome to Real Talk. 
morning. So we want to we want to just like kind of make sense of this announcement that we heard yesterday. I was indicating to Dave uh, when we heard that these eleven leases were you know government's hitting pause on them, and you know people kind of go, well, that's good news, and, and, and it's, there's this overwhelming wave of messages, people saying, do not let off the gas. This is nothing. Uh, you pushed out a map yesterday that I think will be helpful for our viewers to take a look at. Apologies to people that'll be catching this later on the podcast, uh, but but tell us what this map is demonstrating, Kate. Yeah, well, I mean, the the good news was that it's clear that the thousands of people, thousands of Albertans who have been really increasing the pressure over the last few weeks, uh, several months around the coal issue, that that that's clearly having an impact. The government is feeling feeling that pressure, but it's not quite as good as as it's made out to be. Um, You know, that all that this announcement does is it cancels. Uh, or sorry, it puts a pause on the sale of new leases um, in the the Rocky Mountains, and it cancels those 11 leases that were sold in December. But the trick with that is at the scale. So right now there are about 840,000 hectares um, of coal leases in the Eastern Slopes. About half of those are in that zone two that that this announcement is talking about, that lost protections when we lost the coal policy. Um, And these 11 leases make up about 1,800 hectares. So about 0.2% of um, the leases that are out there are now canceled. Um, And that really doesn't address the big issue that people are concerned about, those 840,000 hectares of leases that are still open for for exploration, that are still open for coal mine development, um, that are really the big risk to our water and our lands and our wildlife and our and our public recreation spaces. How significant to you, uh, Katie, like your are conservation director for CPAWS Southern Alberta. I should mention you're a professional biologist. You've been doing this for like 20 years. Um, you're also, I know, proud to point out uh, when you're doing interviews like this or when you're speaking publicly that you're a hunter and you're a hiker and you're an angler. You're somebody that uses and enjoys uh, this part of the province, this part of the country. Uh, when we talk about the impact of rescinding this coal policy, are there other factors at play or is this the big one? Uh, for, for those of us that this is not our line of work and we're trying to get up to speed on this, where does the conversation need to really move to be meaningful and productive? Well, I think, you know, we, we and you've talked about, we've been talking about as, as a province over the last while, the really big risks to our water from, from selenium to, to our lands. Um, but really what we need to be talking about is what do, what is the future of this region? What is the future of Alberta that we want? Is it these big coal mines and that boom and bust economy? Um, or is it that more sustainable diversified economy that helps local communities, that leaves spaces for recreation to hunt and fish and get out and enjoy these places? So it's really, we need to be looking at that big picture. And what we lost when we lost the coal policy was that big picture planning. Um, that, that said, where, where are the areas in Alberta that have more value to us as a province, to, uh, to Albertans, than coal or, or natural resources alone? Um, and so we need to be having that big land use conversation. Uh, one of the things that the, the government talks about in this release as well is that, um, don't worry, all the rest of these leases are still in our regulatory system. They're still going to go through this rigorous regulatory review. And you know we've seen through trying to work through that regulatory process how um, difficult it is for the public to be engaged, and, and that re- there really is no room for for public consultation. Um, and we've seen it, you know, at the ex- exploration phase. I know you talked to Kevin uh, last week about some of the roads and drill pits that are that are happening right now. That that the process that those goes through is really not very rigorous at all um, before we start having that impact on the landscape. Um, I think, you know, we talked in the spring or early summer about uh, the application that was approved to drill in critical mountain goat and sheep habitat um, during during the critical period for wildlife in that region. And that application was applied for, approved, and work started all in the same day, um, which doesn't scream rigor to me. Um, and it's also, you know, the AER is not set up to make these big level decisions. That That's why we had the coal policy, to really look at where are the right places and where are the wrong places for a massive um, a disturbance like coal? It's set up to minimize the risk or, or minimize that damage in places that are already deemed low risk and already deemed socially acceptable 
um, to, to make those those resource trade offs. Um, and and when we now that we don't have the coal policy, pushing everything into the the AER, um, the Alberta Energy Regulator process, really in, increases uncertainty for everybody for industry who might be now in places that are not appropriate or not socially acceptable that, that for people and communities that live in these regions. And of course, for the environment and the impacts that, that we could see um, in the future with these mines. Katie Morrison, uh, Conservation Director for the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. Really appreciate your time this morning. Thanks for spelling this out so we can understand it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, taking a look at our live uh, YouTube comments, really appreciate it. By the way, uh, Sam, this has nothing to do with anything, but did you notice that that some random guy this morning, his comment, he said, wait a second, did that, that announcer woman at the beginning of the show, did she always say Real Talk starts right now i think some points are are in order that's two points yeah for some random guy some random guy gets two points congratulations we did did re-record the intro we record we updated our voiceover with the announcer woman who i slept with last night (laughs) (laughs) the team at st albert and sherwood dodge is proud to be partners with real talk and the 2021 lineup when it comes to jeep is one you're going to want to pay attention to they're getting set to put out that seven passenger jeep grand cherokee that everybody's buzzing about and then of course the return of the grand wagoneer if you're taking a look at like escalades and navigators hang on a sec just wait the grand wagoneer coming out this year looks unreal i was taking a look at it last night just like sort of building my own on the website Woo! they're going to be stocked up with the best jeep selection in alberta at st albert and sherwood dodge make sure you go see scott and the team there we're also really really proud to be partnering you know with the team at friesen brothers friesen brothers getting set to open their 15th location in edmonton that's in less than in fewer than 60 days and we're going to keep you posted just off the hen day there on the south side for more than 60 years they've been proudly supporting Alberta farmers and producers. They only sell Alberta beef, pork, chicken, and turkey, Alberta veg when they can, and of course, Alberta milled flour in their famous sourdough. Friesen Brothers is Alberta owned and Alberta grown. Let's take a look at what's making news this morning, Sam. There's a lot going on. Well, of course, you heard about these 11 coal leases. They're hitting pause on them. We appreciate David Kahn and Katie Morrison taking the time to talk to us. High River Mayor Craig Snodgrass coming up in just a moment. A bit of a cheeky post out of the mayor's office yesterday. It caught our attention, so we're excited to bring him on. Uh, The Conservative Party of Canada leader Aaron O'Toole says that Derek Sloan, a former leadership candidate, is gone. This after it surfaced that he accepted a donation from a known white nationalist. For what it's worth, Mr. Sloan says we received thousands of donations. This one flew under our radar. I didn't recognize the name Aaron O'Toole releasing a statement that racism has no place in the Conservative Party of Canada. I also wanted to tell you, can you point out, can you know what I'm getting for here? The pot for shots out of Michigan. This is fascinating. <laughs> Did you see this? Just on, on the lighter side of life. This is out of Detroit, uh, a place called the Greenhouse at Walled Lake, beginning uh, this coming Friday and then running till the end of February. They're going to run a pot for shots giveaway. So if you show your proof of vaccination and swing by the dispensary, they're going to give you a free PRD, you know, a pre-rolled doobie. So that story... <laughs> kind of catching attention stateside and then this one everybody's talking about here in alberta this is one where i'm I'm curious to know real talkers how you feel about this pat rain the mla out of lesser slave like you know where this has gone surfaced that he was spending a lot of his time in texas not in his riding the mayor the deputy mayor and unanimously the council of the town of slave lake calling for his resignation he refuses to resign premier jason kenny boots him from conservative caucus because he says I'm the leader, and the guy won't even return my phone calls. And then we showed you here on Real Talk about his expense claims. Four months straight of meal claims, 41 bucks a day. It's the maximum you can claim without receipts. Well, yesterday, did you hear that? That's his assistants being thrown under the bus. As Pat Rain says, an assistant of mine made some errors in recording meal allowances. I apologize. I'll make sure I personally review all expense claims before they're submitted. Now, Rachel has written into the show. Rachel Miller says, as a former constituency association myself, 
it's impossible for the MLA to be unaware that any claim was made without his knowledge. They give us their receipts. They tell us what each of it was for. They tell us what category of claim it falls under. They review the submission form. And guess what? They sign it. He's lying. That from Rachel Miller. So there you have it. The saga continues of, I'm going to say, Alberta's lousiest MLA, Pat Rain and Lesser Slave Lake. All right, let's get back to Cole before we start talking about Trump's pardons and the new workplace and trends after the pandemic. We're covering a lot of ground this morning. A release from the mayor of the town of High River yesterday. Uh, it was actually pretty funny, but it's no laughing matter. Uh, Craig Snodgrass releasing a post that, that that basically says, hey, hey, you remember me, Mr. Campbell? He's talking to Robin Campbell, the president of the Canadian Association, Canadian Coal Association and the Coal Association of Canada. Technically, Robin Campbell, former environment minister. He was here on this show. You know, you can catch the interview anywhere you get your podcasts. It's readily available. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll find it there. He says, Mr. Campbell, remember me? I'm that crazy, snot-nosed kid from High River. This is the mayor who stuck his hand up to be mayor right after the flood. He says, I know, crazy, right? He says, if I remember, you and I met a couple times when you were environment minister working together for the greater good. You know, friends helping friends, the good old days. I always thought we could be best friends forever. Mayor Snodgrass goes on to say, anyway, I saw your interview with Jesperson a few days ago. Congrats on your new gig. He says, remember when you said selenium's just salt, nothing to worry about. He says, now I'm no scientist. He says, I'm actually a mortician. It's true. He says, a mortician that wishes he was either a musician like Corb Lund or a professional fly fisherman like Jason Doucette. I think maybe the mayor's been watching Real Talk episodes. He's quoting guest after guest. He says, anyway, I tried getting on the show here because after you made that salt comment, I just wanted to you to know i mean if selenium's just salt maybe we could stock the pacific ocean with cutthroat and bull trout he says he says i like fishing them better than bug-eyed cod but he goes on to show this and this is the part that's not funny at all uh these fishing photos sam if you don't mind teeing these up this is the mayor uh who's going to be talking to us in just a second he says so check this out anyway he says i was fishing a while ago he says my buddy took me out to the elk river in fernie you know, the river that flows past that tech open pit coal mine at Sparwood. He says, check out these fish. In particular, check out the gill plate. He says, I've been fishing for about 20 years. He says, I asked what the deal was here. Guess what it is? With the deformed gill plates, it's selenium poisoning. He says, crazy, right? He says, it's all coming together now. I'm not sure the difference, but I've never caught a fish in my life off Alberta's eastern slopes that looks quite like this. He's the mayor of the town of High River, Craig Snodgrass, kind enough to join us this morning. Your worship, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me, Ryan. So you got a bit of a sense of humor. You, 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 you bring a little laughter to the mix, but no laughing matter, I know for a fact. What prompted you to reach out like that from, from your official mayor's account? Uh, well, I got the support of my council. I've got six of the greatest human beings on the face of the planet right now I get to work with. And I always believe that, you know, even in very serious um, issues like this, that we can still have a little bit of fun. And that, that's what that was, because when the president of the Coal Association of Canada, um, you know, makes a comment like that, it's obvious they're just trying to... Um, keep the conversation just so basic that people will buy into it. Um, and I'm not buying their snake oil. There's just no question. Okay. So what is it in particular here? That's, that's really grinding your gears. Cause it seems like when we're talking about coal mining on the Eastern slopes, we're having three or four different conversations as we've learned already this morning. Uh, so what's your perspective on this? Uh, so the, from the town of high rivers and how I got involved is when I, first started to see how this is actually affecting um, the Highwood River watershed that comes in the High River. And, um, you know, that, that's a big, big deal for us. And um, and not just that, but it's become the point that the removal and the rescindment of the Alberta coal policy, the number one thing that it took out of play that is not in any other document, it's gone. It's stated right in their documents that that is gone now. Um that that opens these class two lands up to open pit strip mining mountaintop removal practices. And there's absolutely no way we are going to put up with that. And I think what all the social media, um, you know, I was calling it outcry and, um, 
frustration from people, but uh, they're furious that they are. Um, it, th this is a mess message being sent to the to the government, and, and I got a couple of messages here. If you'll grant me the permission at yeah. some point in time here, you got you got the floor, Mayor. Take take it away. You're a good man because I like the I like the real talk. But this is a real big issue, um, and this needs to be, I need to say this, um, not as loose as I do some of the other stuff. So my message is this, that the issue at hand regarding the handling of the rescindment of the Alberta coal policy is embarrassing the province of Alberta across the country and on the world stage. The buck stops with Premier Kenny, but the architect of this mess, in my opinion, is Mr. Jason Nixon. He is a very weak minister in the environment, and he has to go. Premier Kenny and Mr. Nixon need to have a talk this afternoon and decide if Mr. Nixon in cabinet is the best path forward for this province. Regardless of whether it's agriculture, business, environment, energy, namely, you name it, they're all watching this around the world. The big players in the energy industry know that you must be able to play in the environment arena if you're going to play on the energy world stage. We cannot have an environment minister like Jason Nixon, who has proven on the coal policy debacle that he cares nothing about the environment. We need somebody that can play in that arena. To Premier Kenny, do you think this charade provides anyone in the investment community the confidence that we have stability in this province? Do you think that President-elect Biden is worried about you when he's watching how you are handling this charade? And don't you worry, he's watching, especially after your message about Keystone yesterday, and there's a boatload of TVs in that Oval Office now, and one will be locked on Global Calgary to watch this play out. Thanks, Ryan. Let's have some talk. <laughs> well, where do I start? I might start by suggesting that people tune into the CBC instead, Craig, but that's just personal. Um, so, oh. so, so you've, so you've, you've, you've suggested that uh, Premier Kenny's embarrassing Alberta on the world stage. That Jason Nixon is a weak minister. That this entire thing is a charade, and that it's going to cost us investment. So you're throwing fastballs out out of the liberal bastion of High River, Alberta, just south of Calgary. How do you think your constituents are going to feel about this? Well, look, th th this isn't a political issue. This isn't a partisan issue. This is not. I am so done with this partisan politics stuff. We, we've had it from the far left, and now we're nailing it on the far right. Bingo. When are we finally going to settle down and get some balance in this country and be able to uh, and be able to deal with some of these issues properly? This is we're done because here's the we thing, because if, if you want real talk and this is real talk and I commend you for bringing it this morning. The real talk is that Jason Nixon ain't going anywhere. Uh, the real talk is that that he is the number two in command with probably eyes on the number one spot. So he ain't going anywhere. And as a matter of fact, he's just released. Uh, he submitted an editorial that the Calgary Herald published that that says, hey, listen, there's going to be no free for all of coal mining on the eastern slopes of the Rockies. I, I see that his colleague, the energy minister, uh, tweeting that, hey, listen, there's been a number of inaccurate statements being made about responsible coal development in Alberta. My colleague, Minister. Mr. Nixon spoke to the Herald to clarify. So so they're not backing down on this at all. You know, your call for him to resign is going to fall on deaf ears. I mean, that's just a fact. Hey, that, that's fine. But what we have to and, and that's their decision. Um, the the outfit that runs this province is the people of Alberta, not Jason Nixon. And I don't think he's number two. He's number one. He's running Kenny right now. Hmm. So that, that, that's a major issue for the premier that yeah, you're, you need to step up and you need to show leadership in this. And I'm not saying you have to do exactly what I'm saying to do. It's your gig. You need to do this. But um, when I talk to people and I've done a lot of it, um, Ryan, that the constant message from everybody, whether it's industry or the people within his own party, the name Jason Nixon continues to be brought up as a major problem on so many levels. I don't disagree. Listener says this is Megan mad respect for the bluntness 
We're keeping it extra real this morning, and I love it. Mayor, what brought you to this point? Like, have you, have you been have you been requesting meetings? Have 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 you been expecting consultation and not getting it? I mean, I, I don't think you probably went from zero to sixty with nothing in between. What took you to this point? No, no, absolutely not. Like when I've been watching this thing play out um, since some friends started posting some of the videos that John and Laura and Mac and Renee Blades uh, were doing. Who are, on who are they? Who are they? Well, they're the ones that are suing the Alberta government. Oh, okay. Cold. Got it. Rescinded, right. So it, their videos and and I know uh, John and Laura a little bit. Oh, I, Laura, we I've spoke never, with we. Pardon me, we yeah, spoke yeah, with Laura yeah, last yeah. week. Yeah, pardon me. Show. Pardon me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. Um, Mac and Renee, I've never met, but um, I started watching these videos and I'm going, well, what's 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 this deal about? And listening to it and and kind of going, you know, it's kind of over my head. I don't understand it. It's down there. I got to take care of High River. And but as it kept going on. Then I finally phoned a mutual friend um, and she started talking to me about it. And then she got um, John to phone me and, and it just spiraled from there. And you, you start, you start like this and going, you know, yeah, that don't make sense. And then you're kind of rubbing your head going, man, how could they screw this up? But now we're at the point where it's just, it's mind numbing, embarrassing what is going on. Um, for this province right now and, and what's happening in my mind on the world stage. Um, so, you know, just before we're done here, I got, I got another message for the people of Alberta when we're done, of course, but um, that, that's kind of how I jumped in. And once I found out more about this mountaintop removal, I can't, I can't fathom. Those are extremely important pieces, not only to me and my family, but to the people of Alberta. And they're just not something that we're willing to mess with. That That's a message that's happening right now. We read a, uh, I read an email from a, a listener who used the alias CJ Ballard um, and provided us with evidence uh, of who they were and, and spoke and, and speaking from a position of authority. We obviously respect their anonymity. Um, but as a, as a biologist and a scientist, and they and they provided us some interesting maps for our review, and we got into it as best we could as laypersons yesterday. Um, but CJ was pointing out um, example after example of how the effects or the impacts of decisions like these remain uh, either forever or at least for the foreseeable future. One example was you know how how certain trout. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to blow it if I try to get too technical, but but let me talk how someone who barely passed high school biology might talk, which is like when when trout lay their eggs, so to speak, they do it by by disturbing the the, the bottom, you know, the the the, the, under, the bottom of the lake. They disturb it with their tails. They create a bit of a divot. They lay their legs and their their eggs in there, cover them up, etc. Well, selenium or whatever it, it leads to can settle to the bottom and harden, and and two things can happen. Number one, it can either harden into a layer where the fish can't lay their eggs. Uh, do fish lay their eggs or deposit them? I think maybe they deposit their eggs. Regardless, they can't do it. And number two, even if they can, in other words, if it's not hardened there, that, that surface on the bottom, it's going to kick up and stir up all of the, the toxic chemicals that have settled there to the bottom, which creates obviously another problem, a recurring problem in the water. That's one example of what's going on here. So it's been interesting to hear from people um, and, 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 and people as well, you know, like you and I, um, I don't purport to have a, a, a real clear understanding of coal mining or of the ecology or of, uh, you know, trying to put mountains back together after you tear them apart. But what I do know is how much I cherish our parks. What I do know is how important they are to me. What I do recognize is the importance of leaving them alone. You know, one of our listeners sent me an email. They sent it to their MLA in Edmonton, Casey Madu. Uh, he's, he's the only United Conservative MLA in Edmonton, a minister, obviously a cabinet minister for Jason Kenney. And this is not not one word of a lie. Uh, M- minister Madu's response to their constituent, who, the constituent said, you never said anything about rescinding the coal policy. We never said anything about pulling out Lougheed's coal policy on the campaign trail. Madu says, we did promise to diversify from oil and gas and coal is part of that. <laughs> I'm sitting there going... <laughs> People, people oh, yeah. are people are thinking about artificial intelligence, man, and like blockchain and, and shit like that. People aren't thinking coal when you talk about diversifying from oil and gas. I couldn't even believe what I was reading. No, and that, that's the thing where the, the, the Kenny government has got themselves um, pinned into a corner here because they made so many false promises. And and uh, and I'll give you my own. I'll be straight up with you. Um, 
I did not vote for um, Jason Kenney at the last election. I voted NDP because of the candidate that we had down here. I believed he was the right person. And I did not vote for Jason Kenney because at the time, in my opinion, he was just full of shit through that whole election and the false promises and the things he was promising people that you'd actually don't have control to do that. And so, you know, I'll be straight up with that. Yeah, it was embarrassing at the time. I had people creeping the house, taking pictures, posting them to Facebook, you know, how dared the mayor. But, um, you know, I, I'm... Wait, wait, wait. I'm what? What? A... Whoa, 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 whoa. What? Say what? People are taking... People were taking... What were they doing? People were taking photos of your house and posting them? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because my wife's my wife's big NDP. She's a nurse. She's a lover of the environment and everything. She's just that... That, that's her gig, right? And, okay, but what and, were the posters? Uh, what were the people saying? What was the purpose of posting where your house is? To shame me about voting NDP. Oh wow, hundred percent. And that's whatever. I gave the guy shit, and we had a chat about it. And he's yeah. still off my arse. You can watch him on Facebook right now. Yeah, coming at me. Whatever. We're having fun now, but that's uh, that's totally okay. But that's the problem, right? Is that you know he's made so many false promises to this problem. Now he's got himself backed in the corner. He's had no success in um, getting the energy industry going. They are desperate. And when you are desperate and you're backed into a corner, you make very dumb decisions and you start making mistakes. And that's what exactly this is. It's a mistake. And the rightful thing to do is admit to that mistake and do the honorable thing in re, uh, reinstating that coal policy and start to speak to the people of Alberta and get it back in place and we can if there's adjustments that need to be made let's talk about them as a province and move forward from there you know what i i, I worry about is knowing how jason kenny operates uh how he behaves how he conducts himself how he's built his political career um you know you know a, a mayor like yourself speaking out against him you know you almost expect punitive measures levied at high river based on this interview you almost expect yeah. him to double down on the policy because people are telling him not to you know what i mean yeah, go do, for it do you do you worry about that a little bit though i mean do you, do you worry that that he might cut off alberta's nose despite its face no i i do, I do not believe that's uh, you know even with an issue like this that is not how government works and that's not what they do and um, if you can't respect somebody um, challenging you and um and, and you're going to punish High River for this. You know, this isn't the first time that I've challenged the premier. I did it when we first started the COVID stuff. But um, I, I don't believe that it, that's not how things when we apply for grants or uh, for certain projects and stuff. Um, those decisions are not made out of spite. I don't, I don't care whose desk they land on. I, I just don't I don't believe that um, if it is, uh, we're about to find out, aren't we? We'll yeah, challenge that one. I mean, I guess so. So, uh, by the way, I wanted to mention that the former president of the AUMA, former mayor of Morinville, Lisa Holmes, says Alberta's mayors stepping up and speaking out for their communities. This is real leadership, and I'm proud of mayor on this. That from Lisa Holmes, who's watching us live this morning. Lisa, good morning to you, and thanks for that. You said you had a closing statement uh, based on how you opened and carried yourself through this. I can't <laughs> wait to hear it. What is it? Well, I, you know, I... I, I I've got opportunities, right? So thank you for um, giving me that. So um, to Premier Kenny, my staff yesterday has a request in for your scheduling staff for you to contact me. And I would really appreciate the phone call. It's extremely important um, that you, con you and I talk prior to our council meeting on Monday. More importantly, to the people of Alberta, never ever think that you don't have a voice and do not think that you are not being heard. Yesterday's announcement proves that you are, and you are the critical piece necessary to restore this policy and protect the landscapes and watersheds of our eastern slopes in Alberta. What has happened by the actions of Premier Kenny, Minister Savage, and Minister Nixon is wrong on so many levels, and we are being embarrassed across the country and around the world. Yesterday's announcement was another strategy by the government of Alberta and the coal industry only to try and whitewash over this scandal and calm the public. It is time to act now, and I encourage all residents of Alberta to either hit resend on any previous emails you've sent to the Premier, Jason Nixon, Sonia Savage, your MLA, your MP, or anyone within the Alberta government, 
or write your new email and send it over and over and over and do it now. Make the calls over and over and over until they get this message. Do not mess with our mountains. Premier Kenny, I beg of you to please put a stop to this charade. I also encourage all municipalities to take a public stand on whichever portion of this issue you choose. It's great to see last night Nate Nanton taking a stand and great to see Calgary discussing this issue of zero consultation on an issue that affects all Albertans. I will also encourage the people of Saskatchewan to take a stand and email your elected officials. Alberta is mandated to make sure that 50% of the water from our rivers must enter your province. This issue is in your backyard too. Now is not the time to let up. We continue to fight for our people, our water and our landscapes. And we will not stop until this is made right. Thanks Ryan. I love the passion. I respect the passion. I can see it. I feel like you're going to need to go have a smoke after this. Uh, don't smoke, kids. Mayor, I want to read a few of these before. <laughs> yeah, don't smoke. Uh, this is unreal. Like Elvis just just tips his cap to you. Uh, Sue says, what a bang up interview. This is Sue Huff out of Edmonton. Says, so great to hear somebody calling out the premier for making campaign promises about things he had no authority to do. She says it really ticks me off, playing off people's ignorance about jurisdiction. Mariah Braun says this interview. I, I don't know the the uh, the using the emojis of like the the chili pepper and the heart. Is that hot love? Hot hot love. <laughs> the interview is it hot love? Let's go with that. Yeah, I, I think that Carol Carol says the mayor's nailing it. I'm cheering as I eat my Cheerios. You put the cheer in Cheerios, Mayor. Lewis says, uh, this is unbelievable. Boy, is he ever bringing it. Mayor's bringing it this morning to Real Talk. Huge respect. His open and frank conversation, his sentiment felt by many in Alberta. Brad is watching. He says, the mayor of High River's on fire. Uh, says, I really like this guy. We need more people like this in Alberta. Um, so people recognize and respect you speaking out. I think it's, I think it's incredibly important. People have been um, conditioned. Uh, over the past few years to be intimidated, to allow themselves to be intimidated, to be silenced, to be bullied. And when the province rises up, it's going to be a reminder to elected officials who holds the power. And I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us, Mayor. You put it all out there this morning. I commend you for it. And I suspect that this is just the beginning. Thanks for talking to us on Real Talk. You're a rock star. Thanks very much, Ryan. That's the Mayor of High River, His Worship, Craig Snodgrass, uh, I haven't even seen <laughs> Sam. How are you? <laughs> wow. Like I, I knew that that was, I, I was expecting kind of a funny interview. Like he was, he was joking around with Robin Campbell and I, you like, I think if this job has taught me anything, it's that every week I get a new favorite small town mayor and, and that's going to be hard to top. Oh man. Um, mayor coming in and telling the premier he's full of shit. I love it. Yeah. Like, well, I think people have just had enough. Yeah. People have had enough. Let me read some of these emails. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? Let me, let me, uh, no, yeah, I'll read a couple of emails. These are, so these are emails. These are real emails you've sent to us. Um, this one from Greg. Uh, Greg's got a super cool surname. I don't know how you'd pronounce this. Is it Ashani? A-X-A-N-I? Well, names with X's in them are always the coolest to me. Uh, Xavier has always been a name I've really liked. Greg Axani uh, emails his, and when I say emails to us, a lot of times they're emails to elected representatives. We're just CC'd on them, which just, can I say on a side note, it's just so, mwah. it's just, mwah. when you're emailing elected politicians and then you're CCing talk at ryanjesperson.com, it's just, mwah. especially since we know the, uh, the premier's office really loves this show. Well, you know, we should thank them. They made the show happen. Uh, so Greg reaches out and he writes an email to his MLA, who's Nicholas Mulliken out of Calgary, Curry. Um, and, and he writes and, and, and he actually sent an email quite a while ago. So they get back to him like months later. And he sent us all the correspondence. And, and they said, we're sorry we didn't get back to you sooner. Um, let us know if you'd like to collect, connect with your MLA and, and we'll work out a time. And, and, and he says, Greg says, well, thank you for your response. He says, the delay is pretty discouraging. Ron Leipert replies to my emails within 24 hours. Ron Leipert, I'm assuming, is his, is his member of parliament, conservative member of parliament. Of course, former health minister, former MLA. You guys know Ron Leipert, familiar name. 
Uh, he says, but I do appreciate the offer of a meeting with my MLA. At the time of writing, I am beyond furious with this government. Uh, the absolute disregard for the voices of the people, the decision to move forward with several policies with no consultation is reprehensible. Greg says, I'm repulsed that my province is now featured in international news on a weekly basis because of this government's disregard for science, the environment, and the complete mishandling of MLAs traveling during the holidays. I'm repulsed that coal policies that have stood since the 70s have been rescinded. This will directly affect rivers that I frequent, like the Old Man, the Livingston, the Highwood. These rivers will be irreparably harmed by this government's reckless decisions. Critical species like the bull trout could become extinct if mining operations are to proceed. This government is so toxic to Alberta, you're even attacking our provincial fish. That's the bull trout. He says, so yeah, I'd be happy to speak with MLA Milliken to educate him on how furious I am with him and this government. He says, I'm not sure what his schedule looks like as it took you three months to respond to my email. Should we maybe look ahead to early April? <laughs> Greg goes on to say, I'm happy, by the way, to see the government. I received this last night. He says, I'm happy to see the government step down from its attempt to delist our provincial parks. Probably not what you guys wanted since you're now selling a bunch of mining leases in those surrounding areas. My sign, Protect Alberta Parks, will remain on my front lawn until we get an MLA that will actually fight for constituents of Calgary Curry. That from Greg. How about this from Kathy? Kathy, uh, again, CC'd us on an email to her elected representative, the MLA out of Lac St. Anne Parkland County. Kathy says, thank you for your reply. Uh, by way of a form email, a form response, a canned response. I'm not satisfied with preventative measures you've listed, and I want it on the record that I do not approve of this project, and I'm profoundly concerned about the negative impact this will have on our waterways and our climate, and I expect you to represent me on this. I will not be placated with references to what administrative tools are available to us after I've seen interviews with multiple experts who are sending up warning signals. Kathy says, I was born and raised in this beloved province. I have lived here for all of my 51 years, and I do not want to see this project move forward, period. The risks do not outweigh any minimal financial benefits, and no amount of money is worth polluting our water and the detrimental effects to our agriculture and tourism resources. That from Kathy out of Lac St. Anne Parkland. Kathy, thanks for that. We're going to turn the page on this. We can come back. Don't worry. Keep the emails coming. Keep the comments coming. Obviously, there's a lot going on, right? I mean, 46 is being inaugurated tomorrow. President-elect Joseph Biden and his vice president-elect Kamala Harris, uh, as of tomorrow, will gain access to the Oval Office. Now, there, there are some things that are going to happen that are going to impact Canadians, and we're going to be taking a look at those, uh, obviously, in, in the days and weeks and months and obviously years to come as we pay keen attention to our most important relationship, in my opinion, undeniably. And that is our relationship with the United States. But in just a second, we're going to talk to a lawyer out of Dallas, Texas, who's going to give us an idea of what Donald Trump might do in his last full day in office, specifically in the context of pardons. Before we get there, we wanted to remind you how Sam and I make sure that we breathe easy every day. We've teamed up with Clean Air Club at cleanairclub.ca, and so can you. When it comes to how you can make an immediate improvement in the quality of air that you're breathing in your home, especially when you're sleeping with your mouth wide open. <sighs> When's the last time you cleaned your furnace filter? Oh my gosh. What's actually floating around in there? What's in those air particles? What can't we see, man? What can't we see? Clean Air Club wants you to breathe easier and save money, and that's why they've made it so easy for you to replace your furnace filters. They drop the replacements off of your front door, sometimes next day. We've been hearing from real talkers that say they were there the next day after I signed up at cleanairclub.ca. Save money. Breathe easier with Clean Air Club. Also want to give a big shout out to the team at Park Power. They're the ones that are powering our hashtag RealTalkRJ, which is on fire. I hope Park Power doesn't mind me swearing in their mention, but the minute that a mayor calls the premier full of shit, the hashtag takes off. And so we're keeping an eye on that. Sam's doing his best to stay on top of it this morning. Park Power wants your business when it comes to natural gas, electricity, and internet. So much so that they've set up the promo code 2021-REALTALK. So when you sign up to hand over your electricity, natural gas, and internet to this Alberta-grown company, 70 bucks off your first bill, residential or commercial, with 2021-REALTALK as your promo code. 
All right, let's get to this next interview. Uh, really, really grateful uh, that Eric Cidio has been able to make time for us. He practices law out of the great state of Texas. We call it our sister province, don't we? He's a professor of law at Southern Methodist University, and he's keeping a keen eye on what's going on in the Oval Office, most especially over the next 24 hours. Eric, welcome to Real Talk, and thanks for joining us here in Canada. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, Ryan. No, man, when we talk about Trump's legacy, you and I could talk for, for three or four hours, I'm sure, without running out of material. But everybody's trying to figure out today what's going to happen specifically on the pardons front. What are you forecasting? What are you keeping an eye on? Yeah, I think they're saying they're probably going to be coming out with about 50 to 100 pardons or commutations today, possibly tomorrow morning. So it'll be a situation where, again, this is nothing new. You know, presidents do this as they leave office. But uh uh, it's it's more, I think, uh, the long-term lasting legacy uh, deals with actually who he's pardoning. So it's going to be really exciting to see or uh, important to see who he uh, pardons, uh, you know, what type of pardons he provides. Uh, of course, we all know what happened on January 6th. There's, there's talk about the possibility of some pardons there. Certainly some people requesting those pardons uh, from that group that, uh, that attacked the, uh, the Capitol. So uh, it's doubtful that he would uh, go that far and, and uh, pardon those folks, but you never know. This is a, a president who's done some, uh, some things well outside the norm. So uh, we'll see what happens over the next couple of days. Yeah, Eric, I've seen some prominent Republicans. I think it was Lindsey Graham I saw yesterday that was, that was almost pleading with Donald Trump to not do that, to, to leave those that will ultimately, that are either facing charges or will be facing charges. I know the FBI is all over this. Uh, following that that attack on the Capitol building, uh, Lindsey Graham, among others, urging the president to steer clear of pardoning anybody in, involved with that. Why do you think that? I mean, it might be an obvious question, but I don't want to treat it that way. Why do you think that's so important? Well, certainly politically, that could, there could be a, a tremendous fallout because of it. Uh, everybody uh, that is relatively reasonable has condemned the actions taken by those individuals who attacked the Capitol. So uh, for a president to uh, to pardon those individuals could be really problematic, not only for the president himself, but for the Republican Party. And I think that's where some of those folks are concerned about uh, what might happen. In addition to that, the president could really be setting himself up uh, for some issues after the fact. Once he leaves office, you know, he's vulnerable to uh, uh, to criminal prosecution. And, uh, you know, he's he's currently going to be tried in the, in the Senate for impeachment, for uh, inciting an insurrection. So all of those things, everything that he does from here on out uh, could play a part in terms of, one, how the senators see him in convicting for uh, impeachment. And, of course, the possibility of obstruction of justice uh, by the Department of Justice after he leaves office. So it's a situation where I don't think something like that's going to happen. Even Donald Trump probably would not have the, uh, uh, the audacity to, to uh, pardon those individuals who, who took part in that, uh, uh, that uh, attack on the Capitol. But uh, but, you know, we've said that before and, and uh, we've been surprised. So so we'll see what happens. Uh, I think the the closer call or the one that I'm kind of looking to see what happens is, uh, is to see if he pardons his family, Jared Kushner, his uh, daughter, uh, some of the close individuals within his uh, circle. Uh, and then, of course, himself. That's yeah. going to be one that is going to be very, uh, very closely looked at and, and constitutionally whether or not he can do it. So. So we'll see what happens. It's wild to think about. So, so Eric, help us understand it, because here in Canada, we don't really have a, a similar thing. I mean, there's there's no such thing as a, as a prime minister, you know, voted out of office or leaving office and 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 absolving a hundred people of criminal convictions. It just doesn't happen. Uh, in this case, we'd be talking about pardons ahead of charges. In other words, preemptive pardons. Can can you help us understand how that would even work? Certainly. We, we saw it uh, most recently, I guess, with uh, with Gerald Ford when he partnered, partnered uh, Richard Nixon back in the, in the 70s, early 70s, back in 74, provided him a blanket, uh, pretty much pardon with respect to everything he did while president. Uh, that, of course, had some political backlash for, for Ford, probably cost him the presidency in the next election. So it's a situation where we do have precedent for it. Nixon hadn't been charged, hadn't really been investigated up until that point. So it was just a blanket pardon for everything he had done as president. And, uh, you know, pretty much stuck. You know, it was a situation where it was never really uh, brought to the Supreme Court in terms of whether or not someone fought it. Uh, Gerald Ford maintained that it was best for the nation and, and did what he did. But the self-pardon might have some real problems. In, in our Constitution, a president can pardon others. 
Uh, it's a grant that is given to others and uh, to, for, to do it for himself just doesn't make sense in the context of how the Constitution puts it down. And some originalists, people who look at the Constitution and are originalists in terms of their interpretation, like his, uh, uh, some of his new appointments to the Supreme Court, may have real issue with the self-pardon just based on the language uh, of what's in the Constitution. So uh, that might be the toughest road to hoe in terms of him being able to pardon himself. But, but I think his family members and others, I think that's probably within the purview of, of what the Constitution provides, and he should be most likely allowed to do it. Now, we're hearing word that he probably won't, uh, because, you know, a pardon is a, uh, gives you a sense or a connotation of, of guilt. You're kind of acquiescing to, to uh, the reality of what you've done. But just the context in which pardons are usually done, you're usually making a request. You're usually asking uh, the president to do something for you. And, and there's a formal process. You, you go through the office of the pardon attorney and it's vetted by the Department of Justice. And, and you can't really do it until five years after sentence. So this is a really different situation. Lots of people are simply approaching him informally. And, uh, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see uh, which which actual pardons he grants. Eric, can the president interfere with or stop impeachment proceedings? Right. That is one thing that is specifically in our Constitution. He cannot stop an impeachment proceeding or pardon uh, someone or, or himself in terms of impeachment proceedings. So that's flat out in there. It's something that he can't do. And also, these are for federal charges. He can only uh, pardon those individuals who've been charged federally. State crimes are not pardonable by the president. That would require a pardon by the governor. So uh, for himself, in terms of some of the things that are happening in New York uh, with respect to some, some indictments and other things, uh, you know, he won't be able to pardon himself with respect to those things either way. Eric, when, when it comes to the changes that, that um, I mean, Americans are anticipating that you're keeping a keen eye on, I think that there's going to be drastic difference. And there's, there's nothing, I mean, it's, it was the same story when, when Donald Trump took office and when Barack Obama was on his way out. There were some immediate changes, some, some undoing of policy. I mean, it was, it, Trump was kind of getting off on it. He was, he was proudly announcing everything he was undoing uh, that a Barack Obama had put into place. Biden will probably do the exact same thing and probably the pendulum will swing back toward, uh, you know, priorities that the Democrats or the Biden administration may hold. Um, this might include or it will include. Certainly, we talked about the Keystone XL pipeline. That's of huge significance to us here in Alberta, the province uh, where we're broadcasting out of uh, energy policy is going to be big. Biden says he's going to make sure that America rejoins the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, I would imagine, you know, the border wall probably would be less of a priority. Probably some changes Biden's promising to immigration policy. I mean, where do you begin as you analyze this, uh, assuming that you have something else to do today, aside from talking to us for six hours, uh, what are you going to be keeping a keen eye on? Certainly. There's there's a number of uh, executive actions that uh, Biden has promised to make uh, as soon as tomorrow afternoon. So as soon as he's sworn his, in as president, you'll see some executive action being taken, as you had mentioned, rejoining the Paris Climate Accords. Uh, immigration certainly is at the, at the forefront here in the United States, uh, dealing with the border wall. So there's a number of things that we're kind of looking at uh, that the president will be taking through executive action. But beyond that, he's, he's promised to present some things quickly to Congress, some things that would make them, you know, of course, uh, legislation that would provide for comprehensive immigration reform uh, and a number of other issues. So I think with you know the Democrats kind of uh, taking control of the Senate, of course, already having control over the House, it's going to be a situation where I think some real change can actually take place as Democrats control uh, House, Senate, and, and the presidency. So, uh, so I think we're going to see some some real change in the first hundred days, and that's what the promise of uh, of Biden is kind of bringing to the fore. Uh, is immediately going to stop the Muslim ban that, that is currently in place. He's going to be dealing with some things. We've got a number of caravans that are coming from uh, Central America through uh, uh, up into the United States. How he's going to deal with those things through executive action will be really telling uh, in the first few days of, of his taking uh, office. Eric, uh, you know, you come uh, you come at us, you know, we, we sort of have I mean, we, I think that you'd find uh, Albertans and Texans would probably see eye to eye on a lot of things. And there's been a special relationship between some of the cities, Calgary and Houston, namely. Uh, I know you practice in, in Dallas and in San Antonio. Now, it's it's a dangerous exercise, as it is here in Alberta, I think, probably to try to paint all Texans with one brush. I mean, you talk to somebody in Houston versus Austin, you're probably going to get some different political perspectives. One of the more prominent 
politicians out of the state of Texas is, of course, Ted Cruz, who's who's who's, you know, to a certain degree, you know, continued his support of President Donald Trump. How would, how would you characterize? And again, uh, it's a bit of an unfair question. But how would you characterize where Texans are at right now with regards to the state of the Republican Party, how they're sorting out what they saw from from this president over the past four years? I mean, you know what I'm getting at. Yeah, well, Texas is uh, is pivotal in the, in the upcoming years with respect to the presidency. Our electoral votes, if uh, if, if Texas turns blue, then, then Republicans will probably never have another shot at the presidency, quite honestly. So it's a situation where it's it's a very uh, tough fight just to, across the board. Of course, some of the things that uh, that Ted Cruz uh, has maintained, uh, some of the uh, uh, inconsistencies, the, the lies uh, about the election fraud and other things has become a real problem for him. We've got a number of major newspapers here in the state of Texas that have asked for his resignation. So it's a situation where I think, uh, you know, he bit off more than he could chew. And, and uh, of course, after the rioting, uh, to continue on in the, uh, in the uh, Senate in the course of, of attempting to overturn the election has become a real problem for him. So uh, I think he's really hurt himself. You know, uh, he's never really had real popular numbers, but his Republican base has always kind of uh, buoyed him. Of course, he ran against uh, Beto O'Rourke uh, in 18 and, and barely won. It was a razor close win for him. So it's a situation where he may have some trouble, you know, uh, in his next election in terms of, uh, of getting the support, maybe even winning a primary uh, in his Republican Party. But, uh, but we'll see what happens for that. You know, we, uh, certainly ramifications for what's, what's going on need to continue. I think a lot of it may have to do with uh, whether or not the president, of course, is convicted in the Senate. And, uh, and his longer lasting legacy and what happens to him once he leaves office. If some of the things that we're hearing uh, in terms of his legal, his criminal you know, issues uh, come to bear, then I think uh, a lot of the folks who were supporting him during the last few years might have some trouble uh, with their political lives over the next few years. Eric Cedillo is a an attorney uh, out of the great state of Texas and a clinical professor of law at Southern Methodist University. I, I see the ball in the background. I, I I wish your Cowboys. I've got a friend that's a super fan. He's one of the partners of this show. I wish them better health next season, Eric. And thank you so much for making the time to talk to us. Absolutely. Real pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Ryan. Yeah, you bet. So there he is, law professor at SMU, Eric Cedillo. We appreciate his availability. Uh, you can let me know what you think about, uh, you know, what you're what you're making of this transition of power. It's it's uh, remarkable. I've never seen anything like it. There's been, uh, you know, per reports, uh, zero correspondence between President Donald Trump and President elect Joe Biden. President Trump will not attend the inauguration, which is I mean, if you have you actually taken the time to think about that? Have you have you said have you wrapped your mind around the signal? I mean, I know because yeah, he's having a party at the airport instead. Yeah, he's having a big send off, big military send off. He's going to board. Uh, I, don't, I think it's Marine One. I think that's typically what the president Marine One's the helicopter. Yeah, Air Force One. Because uh, like, I mean, what I heard and I say this because I've got one of my cans on sideways here because I was troubleshooting something in the background. Um, <laughs> Am I inconveniencing you right yeah, now? Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, <laughs> it's it's because like he wants to fly home to Mar-a-Lago. Yeah, on Air Force One, like the the pettiness of I have to leave on Air Force One is allegedly part of the reason why he is not. You mean as opposed to Marine One? Well, no, like you take because they Marine always one, leave on Marine One. They always leave on Marine One. It's so he's going to go to Andrews Air Force Base and he's actually going to be able to fly on the jet Air Force One home to Mar-a-Lago as the president of the U.S. because he can't fathom flying home on one of the jets he owns with his name on the side of it. <laughs> well, I, I just, I, I wonder, uh, it just, I don't know, because I, I, you, you can't view things through like a kind of a standard lens with Donald Trump. So you can't say this is what they've always done and this is why this is important. And you talk to the experts and the political commentators and they say, well, it's important that the the outgoing president attends the inauguration of the incoming president, the president-elect, because it sends a message not only to the American people, but it sends a message as well to the international community. It's a peaceful handoff. It's a peaceful transition yeah. of power. And that's, that's, uh, that's, that's key to a healthy democracy. That, that we respect the results of the vote. We may not like them, but we respect the validity of it, which clearly is not the case uh, when it comes to 
President Trump and his team, uh, you know, Rudy Giuliani and the rest of them. Um, th- there will be no tour of the. You, you remember when when uh, Melania was was coming in as as first lady and and she handed. You, you remember this when the when the Trumps arrived at the White House and the Obamas were there to greet them and Melania got out and if I remember it was at the Tiffany blue box but she had like she had a gift she had a gift and she presented it to Michelle Obama and and they and you know they can't stand each other. I'm not talking about Michelle and Melania. I don't know what their relationships like. Um, but I guarantee you that that Barack and Donald have zero time for each other. And uh, but there was still that tour. They tour them through the White House. They talk about some of the priorities. And even if it's pomp and circumstance, it's it's important and it's important for the American people to see it. So Mike Pence will Mike Pence has reached out, they say, to Kamala Harris. And, and people are acting like it's like this big thing, like, oh, Mike Pence actually reached out. Well, I, again, congratulations for doing your job, I guess. Mike Pence must be in a wind wobble like he, he served this president at times when everyone was questioning his sanity, his integrity, you know, his his commitment to American democracy. I mean, everything has been called into question with Mike Pence, who has who has been parodied on Saturday Night Live and Kimmel and all the shows. And they've mocked him relentlessly for four years for calling his wife mother and everything else. I mean, the guy's just been you know, nailed to the wall nonstop for four years because of his undying commitment to this president. And then on January 6th, the president all but called for his hanging. I mean, there's video. We showed it to you on the show of, of, of these these domestic terror, these terrorists that compromised the Capitol, that kicked in the walls, that kicked in the doors, you know, f- it winds up with four people dead. The FBI, inv- I mean, it's just, what, it's still, I don't know about you, it's still hitting me what we witnessed on January 6th. It's still hitting me. And we showed you the video of the crowd chanting, hang Mike Pence, hang Mike. This is the Republican vice president that they're calling for his murder. And actually, stories have surfaced that they say it was within seconds that he was that they were able to to shuttle him off to safety before this mob gained access to where the vice president was just moments before. It actually was closer than people realized. Well, we've all seen that video of the Capitol Police officer quite literally leading the mob down the wrong hallway. Yeah, like that. That because the doors behind him were the doors of the Senate, and everybody was right behind that. Like it's just. Like, just think about that for a moment. This this one guy, you know, made enough noise to get the mob to go in the wrong way, and that's essentially the line of defense that they had. Pence perplexes me. I, I don't know what his gain is in this. Meaning? He, I mean, like, I get it. He latched on to this demagogue president that, that never once stood up to him, kind of was his faithful ally right up until, well, right up until the end, and I guess, like... The thing that's that that uh, the Republican establishment, I think, really about people like Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham, that it's like, okay, you did the right thing once, once and only once, you stood up to this maniac at, at a time where you had no other choice. Yeah, exactly. Like I don't, th- they don't get a pass. They enabled him for four years. I wonder if they do get it. I, I wonder. I wonder. You know, in in your opinion, they don't get a pass. Maybe in my opinion, they don't get a pass. What they'll care about is is their voters and yeah. their own personal political careers. I'll be curious. To and their know. donors. Yeah. When you when you look back on the on the tenure of President Trump, it's it's going to be really wild, I think, to see. Like we just you know, we talked to Eric Cedillo. I don't know. Sometimes to me, um, one of the reasons why I'm so grateful that, yeah, many people are listening to us on the podcast. Uh, as a matter of fact, the majority of our audience members listen on the podcast. We so appreciate everybody that that watches on YouTube, whatever you, however you want to take in this show, we love it. But I think one of the advantages to watching live interviews, you know, with your eyes is seeing the body language. And you saw Eric Cedillo, that attorney out of Dallas. I, I said to him, you know, Texas, you know, you've got, you know, this prominent Republican Senator, Ted Cruz, and his face just kind of twisted a little bit because Ted Cruz is, is, has, has, I mean, he's going to the wall for Trump and, I'll be curious to see, you know, who was it? The guest of ours that said it was it was uh, Ian Bremmer that came on uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was it was Jan- it was January 7th that he came on. It was the day after this, you know, the attack on the Capitol. And he said that Donald Trump will go away or Donald Trump may go away. And depending on how the impeachment, I mean, if if you know, if 
<laughs> there's still an avenue for him to seek the presidency again in four years. Wrap your mind around that for now anyway, uh, which is what people are working to eliminate, especially the Democrats and, and probably some Republicans for the future health of their party. But he said Donald Trump will go away, but Trumpism will remain right. There will be another leader uh, that that has, um, you know, equally as a compelling message or at least an understanding uh, equal to Donald Trump's of, of how to to capitalize on momentum, how to how to how to, you know, tweak your support base, how to how to how to dog whistle, how to say those words, how to call out an army like Trump did, like Trump has done many times. Uh, and um, and it'll be interesting to see what the future of the Republican Party looks like to to a much lesser degree, to a much lesser degree, but not a negligible degree. There are similar conversations about conservative politics in Canada. Right. I mean, if, if you really think about it, Alberta, I'm about to just go off on a thought. Are you with me on this? Do you mind? Do you everybody good to like grab a coffee and your just, name's on the show? Dude. Everybody, everybody good to just take a second here. Alberta politics. You remember we read that letter yesterday from a listener. Pardon me. I don't remember the name, but a listener yesterday wrote in and said uh, they're, they're young. They're in their 30s. And they said they said, pardon me. I haven't really paid much attention to Alberta politics since 20. They, they said 2012 was when I started paying attention. So this listener said, you know, before 2012, I kind of have, you know, vague memories that they said, I remember some of Ralph Klein's cuts on education and I don't remember what the other one was, but they had, they had but they said, but 2012 is when I really started paying attention. And I remember reading that email yesterday and thinking, you know, 2012 was kind of the beginning. I mean, you can make arguments that it was a little earlier, but that was really the beginning of when Alberta politics, I think, officially, officially became the most interesting province to watch in Canada. And if you watch political stories in the province of Alberta, 2012, fascinating with Danielle Smith leading the Wild Rose into the election, looking like they were going to win. Right. And then the Alan Huntsberger stuff comes out. Lake of Fire. Everybody remembers that voters had a punitive spirit and they decided that that's not our Alberta. And they didn't like that that Danielle didn't drop Alan Huntsberger as a candidate. She referenced that, by the way, in her resignation on the radio the other day. She referenced Alan Huntsberger back in 2012. Um, and we'll talk to her about that when we talk to Danielle, uh, when the time is right for her. And then 2015, obviously goes without saying, right? Jim Prentice, Rachel Notley, the whole nine yards, 2019, or let's say, let's call it 2016, 17. Jason Kenney comes in, leaves Ottawa, returns to unite Alberta's conservatives, right? The, the leadership race, some of the questions around that. 2019, the election now where we are, you know, mayor's calling the premier full of shit on the record on live interviews. So we're just getting started. And now what happens to the conservatives in Alberta that are unhappy with the United Conservatives that are taking a look at other movements? Do we return to another two parties? Do conservatives have a hard time staying united? Right. And then what about on the, the center center left in Alberta? I probably I would imagine the, the Alberta party would bristle at, at being described as center left. I'd say they're probably center right, if anything. But you get that idea. So we talked to David Kahn. Didn't really have time to talk to him about the future of the Alberta Liberal Party. And, and quite frankly, the polling numbers right now are, are not favorable for the Alberta Liberals nor the Alberta Party. But what happens on, on the center, center left side of politics in Alberta? Like, what does the next election look like? Is it two party? It won't be two parties. There's the Wild Rose Independence Party. There, there are other parties. And I'm not, you know, with respect, I'm not dismissing them. Yeah, probably two dominant parties. But yeah, like, are, pe are people going to see it as as two choices like you're either you're, you're either with jason or rachel or, or you're with whomever is leading the united conservatives and rachel unless something changes but notley has said she'll seek re-election she wants to be premier again she's going to take another run at it well and she is personally more liked in this province than jason kenny is like lots of polling revealed that. sure i mean i'm i'm wondering what else i'm what's what's coming down like like i don't want to start throwing people's names out to start rumors that 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 i have no basis in but like I don't know, a guy like Brian Jean, you have to imagine that a guy like Brian Jean might might want to reintroduce himself to Albertans and say, remember me? Remember me? I wanted to lead the United Kingdom. Remember me? I mean, I think that's fascinating. And then on the federal front, too, with regards to Canada's conservatives, we're going to be talking on Thursday uh, of this week, uh, 9.05 Mountain Time. Jay Hill will join us. He's the leader of the Maverick Party. Uh, this is a a party that is, uh, I mean, uh, certainly a conservative party in Canada. Jay Hill, a former senior cabinet minister under Prime Minister Stephen Harper, uh, so his he, he's uh, you know he's not a joke, 
right? He's he's held a significant office. He understands politics. It's not, you know, you see some of these fledgling parties and and and, I, and I'm not going to use names. I'm not trying to be a jerk, but but a lot of the leadership lacks a clear understanding of reality. Jay Hill has, has has been on the Hill. Jay Hill has done the work. Jay Hill has served in government. He sat in federal cabinet and he's now leading this maverick party. So we're going to try to get more of a sense of what they're all about. But but is that a party that could be taken seriously? Like, what about, you know, you had Maxime Bernier and the people. I was party about Canada, to bring that up. Right? I was going to say, like, Maxime Bernier, who's an actual Ottawa veteran, could not gain any steam with the People's Party, which, again, is the party with the weirdest sounding name because it's a hard right party and it kind of sounds socialist. <laughs> the People's Party. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I, you know, and, and Max, that, that was an interesting case study. Yeah. The thing... <laughs> That was the study of a sore loser. I'm feeling generous. Well, but he, but he, it's, it's no small thing to start up a political party and immediately glean support. So that was interesting to watch. However, when you glean the support by going, for example, straight to the neo Nazis or straight to the white nationalists, right? Then, then you sort of limit the cap of growth and you also pretty, quickly paint your party with a certain brush so the people's party of canada didn't stand a chance in the federal election we said as much ahead of time and it proved itself to be true uh but i wonder about this maverick party if for no other reason that it creates a bit of a split it creates two options on the conservative side and i'll be curious to see how it goes again jay hill leader of the maverick party will be joining us uh here on the show 905 mountain time on thursday i tweeted about it yesterday and we're keeping an eye on some of your comments we have we want to know your questions i'm most interested to hear from conservatives we always want to hear from all of you but but i want to hear legitimate questions in earnest from conservatives so please feel free to pass those along and we'll be looking for those again a reminder that these types of conversations are made possible by the teams at at, at the, the the companies the corporations the family-owned businesses that have joined us as real talk builders and that includes the team at kubi energy tesla certified solar installers that are working throughout bc and alberta offices in kamloops and of course, right here in Edmonton as well. And one of the things that I know that Kubi Energy is really proud of is the work that they do for you. And I'm not just talking about getting up on your roof and getting those solar panels installed safely. I'm also talking about you know these these incentives and the forms you got to fill out and, and some of the rebates you can get. They handle it all, including a four thousand dollar rebate from the city of Edmonton right now. You can check out KubiEnergy.ca. That's K-U-B-Y Energy.ca, or give them a call at seven eight zero three four zero Kubi. And if you missed our positive reflections yesterday, you can check it out on our YouTube page as a separate entity. Every Monday, Kubi presents positive reflections. It's a way to put a smile on your face and start your week off on the right foot. You know, another way to start your week off on the right foot is a face full of dilly bars. What a surprise you went there. I know. I just couldn't you resist. You love the dilly bars. Well, like I just... zero in on the dilly bars. Dilly they're, bars they're are so accessible, you know? Yeah. They're, they're, they're nice and clean. They're on the stick. You know, you, you take them out of the packaging nice and cleanly, and then there you go, bing, bang, boom, and they're done. See, I grew up with dipped cones. That was always the, the oh, treat I mean, at Dairy Queen. I mean, dipped cones are their own. Should we talk about dipped cones today? There's definitely photos or possibly video of me smashing a dipped could cone you, all could over you my parents' take car camera, Is this camera three? That's, yeah, I'm camera three. Could there you take camera three? Could you look into the lens, Sam, and tell us what you love about the dipped cone at Dairy Queen? So the thing about the dipped cones. Oh, I like is it. They drunk. take this delicious Dairy Queen soft serve, and then open up this vat of beautiful hot <laughs> chocolate syrup, <laughs> and you get this beautiful crusty coating on the outside. Oh yeah! Ladies and gentlemen, Samuel G. Brooks, unbelievable job! If you take over reading the commercial spots, then I can like top up my coffee and powder my nose and do all sorts of things. I, I we might have just we might be onto something. The Dairy Queens in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, we're now into minute three of this ad read, um, are offering right And here's the real reason why I talk about Dilly Bars is because it's two for one right now. You buy a box of six, you get a box of six free only at those six locations, only if you tell them you're a real talker. And don't forget, they have dairy-free Dilly Bars. All right, let's get into this. Is Panita ready to go here? Is she just, she's like, what? She's probably wondering, what have I got myself into? What are these maniacs even going on about? What is this show? I thought it was reputable. 
and all they're doing is talking about ice cream. Panini McBride is the is the recently introduced and newly minted executive director of the Downtown Business Association right here in Edmonton, Alberta, making her Real Talk debut this morning. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, and I'm a listener, Ryan. I know the shenanigans you get up to. Don't we, worry about me. We get up, we get up to <laughs> shenanigans on a daily basis. Are you a, are you a, do you have an item on the Dairy Queen menu that would be, I think you can learn a little bit about someone's personality by what they would order at Dairy Queen. Is this, is this something that you could chime in on here? Ooh, that's a lot of pressure. Um, yeah. I think the, the go-to is a dipped cone. The like dipped just cone. Just yeah, I think I think that that just proves that advertising works. I'm going to suggest that, that you just had that front of mind based on Sam's compelling delivery. You're not wrong. Yeah, but, but I do I do think that's probably my most frequent order. Yeah, either that or an Oreo Blizzard. <sighs> See, I was going to yeah. I mean, the Score Blizzard, the Smarties Blizzard, um, and then you always meet people that do things like they add flavor pumps in there, and then people have all kinds of wild ideas. Um, and, and no respect being shown right now, quite frankly, to the peanut buster parfait. Nobody's even talking about the mix of salty and sweet. Uh, hey, Punita, let's get serious. Now, I want to talk to you about a whole bunch of stuff with regards to post-pandemic work habits, the reality of downtown, uh, the, real, you know, the commercial real estate implications. Now, you start this job. You come into this job mid-pandemic. And so you kind of, I mean, you, you know, Past executive directors of downtown business associations across Canada have had their own unique challenges based on the realities within their own cities. But how are you approaching this assignment? It's a good question. I think there's people in my life who have questioned my sanity in taking on this role at this time and coming back into the workforce after after my first mat leave. So it's been an interesting month, to say the least. But um I'm approaching it in a few different ways. I'm just, I keep looking out the window because anytime I'm talking about what's happening downtown right now, it's like, I've got a great view of it right in front of me. Um, our streets are quiet right now. Um, and so we're trying not to focus too much on what's happening right now. And we're thinking, you know, as we get through this lockdown, as we get into the, the stage of slightly relaxed restrictions, um, we're focusing a lot on how we're going to draw people back downtown. We've got so many fun and exciting things in the works to do that. But then much more seriously and more big picture, um, what happens as we move beyond the pandemic? You know, we've, we've vaccinated a huge chunk of the population, hopefully vast majority of the population, um, and people are coming back to work. And and what happens then? And so those are sort of the much bigger and much more serious conversations that we're having. And, and we're having them with our members and, and our members are, as I'm sure you can imagine, a whole diverse mix of the bars and restaurants and retail storefronts that rely on foot traffic downtown, who of course are, you know, hurting in a, in a very big way right now. And are, I don't think anyone's looking forward to reopening more than those folks. Um, up to, you know, all of our, our businesses in the office towers, um, who are trying to make decisions about what their office looks like um, after going through this very significant disruption through COVID. Um, and then our, our developers and our builders and, and people who are looking to spend a whole lot of money building high rises and all kinds of other projects downtown. So, you know, lots of different stakeholders have a lot of different opinions about what the future of our downtown looks like. Oh my gosh. And, and I know you and I could probably talk for an hour on that. I mean, I, I have to imagine that there, there have even been some pivots on the fly of uh, maybe some of the construction, I, I don't, and maybe I should form, form this as a question because maybe you do know. I'm I'm totally speculating based on nothing, uh, but I would suspect that that some builders that that maybe we're looking at office towers may now be looking at condo towers or or something along those lines just because of where trends are going with commercial real estate. Um, Panita, I want to read if I could read your words. I hope that's not weird, but but you tweeted back on on January 14th, and and this is kind of why. I mean, we want to talk to you for a number of reasons, but this is what jumped out at me. You said a lot of companies are having conversations right now about long-term reduction or even abandoning physical office space or moving to the suburbs. You said it's breaking your heart. Uh, you said, don't get me wrong. I do get it. Remote work is a lot cheaper. Many employees prefer it, but it does beg the question. What are the consequences for our downtowns and our cities, the heart and soul of the urban experience? And I'm with you on this. You say like the arts and culture and food and entertainment businesses we so desperately miss because they give us life. You say our downtowns aren't Disneyland. They aren't manufactured to wait patiently for your next visit. 
They live and they breathe and they require daily investment and participation. And whatever role you play in these decisions, you say, I only ask that you consider the ripples that extend far outside of yourself and your bottom line. So you have a way with... Can I hire you to read all of my tweets? I well, like I, well, I might hire I might hire you to write my material because I was just going to say you have a real you have a way with words. I love that downtown is not Disneyland. It doesn't wait patiently for your next visit. Um, I'm in regular correspondence with friends that are hospitality operators downtown, and I I feel I'm, I've run out of ways to rephrase how sick I feel for them. Um, and we know that we're doing what we have to do right now to, to try to stomp this thing down, but the permanent effect could be devastating. So take us into your argument here. I mean, you, you say, I understand it. You say, I understand, you know, I mean, there are people right now that are watching us. One of the reasons why I think this show has experienced such rapid growth, Puneet, out of the gates is because we have a captive audience. Everybody's at home. You know, we, we probably would have had more challenges building an immediate audience if everybody was commuting at 8 or 8.30 in the morning. So, you know, there is undeniably a difference in how people are are working. You know, do you see... This being a permanent change, some people I know are desperate to get back into the office. Some people really miss what that brings. Yeah, and and just like you say, some people feel one way, some people feel another way. I have a hard time making this, you know, one big sweeping uh, discussion or argument um, because it's true. A lot of companies have have had this sort of forced onboarding onto digital collaboration and communication tools. Um, and it's working really well for them. And, and there's a lot of, there's so much research out there um, about uh, productivity and remote work, creativity and innovation uh, and remote work. Um, and the, the sort of general consensus based on everything I've read is that in terms of productivity, you can make a case that a company can be just as productive remotely as they are in, in person. And, and for certain types of tasks, um, I think a lot of people are feeling comfortable and confident that, you know, my team can do their work independently from home. We don't need them in the office. But, uh, you know, and this is this is where it gets it gets a little bit more convoluted. And depending on the source and what their interests are, they're going to present data in different ways. But there is a lot of compelling data that creativity and innovation and company culture, staff retention, um, staff loyalty, all these kinds of things that the business community knows is really important to being successful in 2021 in business. Um, those things suffer when your entire staff is remote all the time. And so I think it would be, I mean, I, I would be full of shit, to be honest, if I said, you know, you know everyone's going to come back downtown. There's no changes long term. Obviously, that's not true. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's going to be long lasting and permanent changes to how we work based on how people have learned to um, work remotely and, and give staff that sort of flexibility. So I think that's going to stay. Um, my point was more around, so there's two different parts of this conversation. There's the, the stuff around, is it good for business to have people working remotely? And what are the benefits of working in the office versus remotely? What does the office of the future look like? I'm honestly more interested in what's more relevant to my job is the other part of the conversation, which is, you know, as you're having those conversations about what's best for your business, don't forget that your decisions have a huge impact on the world around you. So as you make these decisions, just like we expect business to make decisions to, to do business more sustainably now and to consider things like diversity, equity and, equity and inclusion, I'd argue those two things are more important than what I'm talking about, obviously. But I'd ask them to also consider how where they're located and the role that they play in the business community, especially in our downtown core, um, that they can't be making decisions about where they work and how they work in a bubble. Because, you know, there's a phrase that city builders have been saying for many years, as goes the downtown, so goes the city. And if we're serious about economic diversification, and I love that I mean, some of your former guests have set me up really well on this conversation, we know how important economic diversification is right now. We know that our startups and our entrepreneurs in the, in the knowledge and the tech and innovation worlds are a huge part of the puzzle for what our economic prosperity and resiliency looks like as we move past this time. Um, so we know that and our downtown and the, the opportunities for creative collisions, 
the, the type of quality of life that leading talent in those sectors are looking for. Um, we need to build that in our downtown. And a big part of that is making sure that we're all here and we're invested. We're spending our time here. Our businesses are, are setting up shop here. The longer term vision, the reality is that, you know, the office, the role of the office is going to change. Um, we're actually kind of lucky in our downtown that our downtown land isn't filled with office towers, to your point. We've got lots of residential development opportunity, and there's a ton of that happening. You know, we've had thousands of people move downtown over the last five years or so, and there's more of that coming. There's four high rises that are just, you know, ready and waiting for shovels in the ground. There's going to be many, many more. But in the interim, while we get to the, until we get to the point of being a really dense residential mixed use neighborhood downtown, the role of our offices is still really, really important in maintaining the vibrancy that we need. Punita, uh, do you do you think that you, you probably won't like this question, but at, at what point does Edmonton hit a saturation point when it comes to the condo market? I just I, I, I keep an eye on what's being built and I just wonder where's the like where are all these people coming from? I, I just I can't wrap my mind around it is Obviously, you want to see as much construction downtown as possible. So I'm curious to know how you'll answer the question. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I'm not an expert by any by any stretch. Like I think uh, developers and commercial real estate, or residential real estate experts would have a lot to say about that. But I think we're already seeing a change in, in the types of buildings that are going up. Like a lot of the buildings that are about to, to start going up are, are rental only. And so you know, that industry, they know what the market's looking for. They know what kind of the demand is out there and they see the way that our economy is going and that, you know, as we continue to drive growth again in these sectors that are based downtown um, with talent that is looking for an urban walkable lifestyle, that there is a demand and there's going to continue to be an increase in demand for people who want to live here. And so, yeah, there's a bunch of new rental buildings going up. You're going to see a lot more of that. Um, You know, it might be, my generation and younger are in many cases not looking to buy a condo. They're looking to rent. They want this lifestyle. Um, they want all the amenities. Um, and and those are the types of products we're going to see. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not the expert, but I, I get no, your and, point. And I will, and yeah. I will suggest that developers are, are typically pretty savvy in, in the sense they don't, they don't typically tend to build $300 million buildings when there's no market for them. Um, so I always keep a keen eye on, uh, Who's that guy that the, they call him the Brad something? And they call him the Condo King. He's out of Toronto, and he came into Edmonton. Bradley. Yeah, and he came in with like big fanfare, and he's going to build all these big towers. And all of a sudden, it was like no, nope, like pulled the plug on that. I mean, those stories are you know we take a look at the the uh, it starts with an A. Jeez, this isn't like a multiple. I, I'm I'm like quizzing you on this. What's that big tower that's supposed to be built on East Jasper, like eighty one Street? What is it? Aldrit. Aldrit is the developer. Aldrit. Ald- yeah. the Aldrit Tower. Thanks, Sam. Uh, this is the one right by that. Uh, that uh, anyway, East Jasper Avenue, 95th Street area, that sort of a thing. I mean, like you, these are massive projects, 81 stories people are talking about. Uh, curious to see where they go. Uh, I want to bring this back. I mean, you're the you're, you're the downtown business association executive director. To be fair to you, we should keep the majority of our conversation focused on that. Um, Bucky tweets in using the Real Talk RJ hashtag says, and I totally 100 percent agree with this, says serendipity is what disappears when the offices are closed. Chance meetings uh, that create are missed. And I think of I, I think of even in my own personal life, like my what I mean is my personal professional life with regards to being a, an event host, a, a, a connector, uh, with regards to, to uh, you know, attracting business or creating relationships. or It all happens when you're mixing and mingling, when you're running into people, bumping into people, uh, when you're at the fundraising dinners and the galas and all these types of things that I, I know I am just desperate to get those back for, for a number of different reasons. And it feels like they're miles away from right now. Do you think that it's going to take convincing? I mean, is there going to be like a, a big campaign? Should we expect to see an obvious concerted effort from the DBA and from you and from others to to really try to remind people of of what a busy downtown brings to a city? What are you planning? Yeah, that's part of my concern. And and so it's funny that I've, you know, I'm here right now and having these conversations cuz Really, I just got to get used to thinking before I tweet now. People fail out more attention, I guess, when I tweet things. Because, you know, I put that out just kind of as a reflection. I think I think these conversations that people are having, they're definitely premature. They're definitely just conversations right now. Um, 
you know, we see from the data that we have about vacancy rates, like there's no major changes yet. Um, and I don't think honestly, there's going to be a significant change. Um, you know, the people are doing short term extensions on their leases for their offices right now. No, I think generally people know now is not the time to be making long term decisions about yeah. the future of your office. Um, but I wanted to put it out there more as a reaction to sort of this laissez faire attitude that I was sensing a little bit that I wanted to call out and face head on. Like, you know, even a guy responded to my to my tweet thread that you read and said, um, you know, I used to be in the office a couple of days a week, suburban office other days. Um, I see myself going downtown less and less. It's just not valuable to me. So, so the world changes. And, 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 you know, harmless tweet on, on its face, but in my role and in what I'm thinking about, uh, that was the kind of thing that kind of broke my heart because, okay, so some of these trends might, might just be expected and, and some of these people might not be as invested in our downtown and that's fine but I want to say that you know so the world changes that's not just like a okay whatever like there are implications if this were to if that attitude um, were to build to a critical mass which again I don't think it's going to but I think that's the kind of thinking and attitude both from individuals and from businesses that I just want to address and say, no, it does matter. Um, and whether you see the value for yourself or your business of downtown office space um, is a different conversation and I'm not here to tell anyone how to run their business. Um, but I would just ask that you not act like it's no big deal if you, if you and others decide to, to you know, go to a suburban office or, or get rid of office space altogether. Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of view those those comments through a certain lens. I remember when people were, you know, people were complaining, people that lived. I, I know we're getting really specific talking about Edmonton here, and, and, and I want to be clear to our, you know, to our, our audience outside of the Metro Edmonton region to for, sort of try to explain what I'm talking about. But if you pick you know, like 104th Street, for example, right by the arena and some people were, you know, I remember when the when the arena was going in and was being constructed and this. I mean, what is it? What is it? Panita, something like two and a half billion dollars of development permits, I think, have been issued. I mean, it's just done an unbelievable job transforming the north end of Edmonton's downtown. It's been unbelievable what ICE Districts has brought. And and there are detractors and people that, that don't prefer some of the impacts it's had. And that's fine. Um, but people that lived on 104th Street that, that basically runs right up to the arena saying, you know, I'm out of here. This is just, you know, it's 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 horrific. The noise and when people pour out after a concert or a game and the, all the all the, these loud people. And I'm sitting here thinking. You bought a condo in the downtown core of a city of a million people, and you're expecting the quiet and privacy that comes with an acreage in Strathcona County. Like I'm not to me, there are certain bits of feedback that I kind of go, eh. Like I don't, I, I don't mean to disrespect the person, but the perspective to me is ridiculous. I don't know. I, you know, I think that people. I are- hear you. I, I hear you 100. percent And you know, one thing that I've started saying. Um, is that, you know, if I think about my vision and what I want to try to accomplish in this role, I'd like to help build a downtown for everyone while recognizing that downtown isn't for everyone. Um, And so what I mean by that is, you know, working towards a more accessible and inclusive place, both in terms of the business community, um, and that means, you know, opportunities for Indigenous and Black entrepreneurs and other groups who have just felt utterly unrepresented and left out of our downtown business community. So I want to address those kinds of things, as well as other types of inclusivity and accessibility, like making sure there are housing types for families, making sure there are neighborhood amenities for families, so that as we look to have a denser residential area in our in our downtown and more and more residents that we're not excluding, like, I don't live downtown anymore. I've got a baby now. Um, you know, you can't really get three bedroom condos that were kind of what we were looking for downtown and I'm, I'm looking to, to see what I can do to help bring more of that making sure that seniors feel welcome and uh and a part of downtown so taking down the barriers um to what you know groups that may not have felt at home or welcome or or a part of downtown before but also recognizing that if you're someone who your number one priority is free parking where you don't have to walk more than 15 feet to where you're going and quiet, you know, 24 hours a day and, you know, never having to face head on um, some of our, our deep 
and wide ranging social issues that often do come to a head downtown. Um, if, if those things are your, or your top priorities, you're, you're probably never going to be a big fan of downtown and you're probably not going to be our core audience as we look to, to the future of our downtown. So yeah. that's kind of, yeah, you're right. I mean, some of those comments, if the downtown isn't for you, that's fine. <laughs> I saw that uh, Justin Archer, who I know you and I both know well, is one of the principals at, at Berlin, uh, an ad agency in Edmonton, you know, responded to your tweet and said, yeah, I agree with you. He said, and I go downtown every day, but it is pretty grim down there. He says, I'm also starting to wonder whether I'm the fool here paying rent for nearly a year on an office that nobody uses. Um, that drew a response from Amy McBain, uh, another uh, advertising professional at Edmonton, a uh, good friend of ours. She says, as soon as these patios are back open, you can find me wandering the streets looking for friends. Amy, I'll be right there with you. Um, Amy, by the way, also chimed in and said with the endorsement of the Oreo Blizzard that you were uh, immediately the smartest person in the room. So you got that from Amy. Um I'm happy to see that that Robin Patches is watching this morning. Robin's the president of the Oliver Community League. Uh, for our friends tuning in from Calgary, Oliver is kind of, sort of like Kensington. It's kind of just outside downtown with a mix of residential and light commercial. It's, it, I, I'm not totally comparing them. Um, in Vancouver, it might be kind of like that Robson, Nelson, Butte area, just out of the mix, but pretty close to downtown still. Robin says, I'm curious... Um, on Punita's thoughts on the conversion of office towers to residential buildings. We touched on that a little bit, but what does that do to the makeup of downtown? It obviously, I think, provides more opportunities for even families or individuals like yourself that are looking to move down to the core, maybe get rid of a car or go from two to one. I mean, it could prompt some pretty significant lifestyle changes. Yeah, that's an interesting conversation. There's all kinds of, um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be attending a couple of webinars and panel discussions on the subject in the next next few weeks. There's lots of conversations about what we do with office buildings that are just, there just isn't really a market for anymore. The nice thing with Edmonton is that I don't think we're, we're anywhere near that point. I mean, I personally haven't been a part of or heard any local conversations about that. You know, we look at Calgary's office va- office vacancy rate, and I think they're in, in probably a little bit more of a tipping point situation where they just had so many office towers, you know, in, in the height of, you know, our oil and gas sector really being headquartered in downtown Calgary and all kinds of different um, huge businesses taking up those towers. So they've, I think, suffered a lot more of a disruption than we have. Edmonton never really was a big, like, big head office type downtown where with, you know, like all these office towers that were in this precarious situation. So yes, we've got some vacancies and, and, you know, you might see that trend upward um, or you might just see fewer new builds. Like you said, you might just not see as many office towers going up in the future and instead see residential towers going up. So yeah, I don't know how, how relevant the office tower conversion is in Edmonton at this moment, but I certainly think it's, it's relevant elsewhere. And, and, you know, I, I never say never. And there could be those conversations happening that I don't know about. But at the end of the day, what I'm hearing from all kinds of folks, all of our different stakeholders, people at the city, city builders, urban planners, is that our long term destiny as a downtown in Edmonton is that we are going to be a residential neighborhood um, with mixed use, lots of office buildings still, lots of obviously stores and bars and restaurants. But um, that residential development is really the long term piece of the puzzle um for what our future looks like panita you're a big you're a big draw here i'm i'm i'm, I'm noticing that uh we've we've got current city councilors like aaron paquette we've got mayoral hopeful cheryl watson's watching right now we, we've got entrepreneurs that are tuned in i want to just rip through a whole bunch of comments tell me what jumps out at you heather heather wilson's watching she says i'm sure there are a lot of workers who are not missing their cubicles um heather you're probably right about that uh, you know, Aaron uh, Paquette, the counselor, says, I just wanted to hop in on this conversation. He says the Urban Planning Committee today is actually talking infill and how infill can be more of a missing middle focus instead of just skinny mansions. Um, Brandon says there's still not enough affordable housing, especially downtown. Ken says Edmonton needs to learn how to mix living space and co-working space in the same building. That's kind of like the Sears Tower model in Chicago. If you if you if you learn a little bit, read up on on the idea of the Sears Tower. It was always that you could be born, live, and die in there without ever leaving. Um, Ken says not just bottom floor retail and upper floor residentials. James says this is why uh, you know groups like uh, meetings like the AUMA Alberta Urban Municipalities are so important. It allows municipal leaders to informally meet and make things happen and put pressure on the provincial government. 
Um, Arnold is watching, says, I'm a millennial who works downtown. My house costs less than all those condos. The trade-off isn't really worth it when you can have a backyard, be centrally located, and have no condo fees. Jacqueline says, you know, a lot of people will rent the condos that Panita's is talking about because nobody can afford to buy anymore. And people are sick of suburban life with no trees and long commutes. Um, Brandy says, working in my home office only has me feeling extremely disconnected. That was my experience when I was doing radio uh, for about six months out of my garage. Um, there were some benefits for sure, uh, but there was also a lot. Of, there was a lot missing. I, I couldn't wait to get back into a studio. I, I didn't envision building my own studio, but here we are. Um, but but I, I would imagine that a lot of people are going to be eager to get back downtown. Um, it's interesting to see here. I mean, I even heard from John. I'm trying to find it really quickly because uh, John Williams, uh, John owns Blue Plate Diner, which is one of my favorite restaurants in the city. He says, hey, the Ice District was not good for my business on 104th Street. John's moved his to to the Stony Plain Road, 124th Street area. And by the way, I should mention some follow up here on a previous conversation, Panita, that you won't care one bit about. Uh, John has agreed to house, to, to provide a home for several Jespo mugs. Uh, at Blue Plate Diner, they use vintage and retro coffee mugs, and he's agreed to find a home for some of the old Jespo mugs. So, John, we appreciate that. Um, Nina's watching. He says, I worked at the DBA when it was the old boys club, and it's incredibly refreshing to see Punita take over with fresh and inclusive ideas. I know you're going to respect the people that came before you, but what's one new focus you'll take what's a stamp what's like the panita stamp look like that you intend to put you're one month into the new gig um how will you approach this job a little bit differently every executive leader does i think there's two pieces to it that you know again i'm only a month in so so easy there but um i think one is what i was talking about around inclusivity and it's i mean it's no secret um what the dba went through in the summer that sort of led to me sitting in this seat so i think our board is um very committed and very interested in making sure that we are um working towards a more inclusive and welcoming downtown business community for everyone and not even just the business community just downtown in general um, and recognizing where there are barriers that some of us uh, might not even see or be aware of. Um, so I think that's a big piece of it. And, and the nice thing is that that was actually part of our strategic plan, even in 2019. But um, it's one of those things that was there. And there was you know a couple projects under it that I think had value. But I think as we go into strategic planning again this year, for me personally, I think that downtown for everyone idea that I talked about is, is a big one. The other one is my background is in, as we talked about, marketing, communications, advertising. Um, I think we need to be telling a unified and compelling story about what our downtown is, what it can be, who it's for, and how it's driving our economy into the future. And so um, that storytelling and that and that sell and that, you know, bringing everyone along for the ride is something that I'm really excited for. And it's, it's obviously what I've been doing in the past. So I'm looking forward to bringing that with me. Yeah, this is, uh, I want to make sure that I pronounce this listener's name correctly. I think it's, uh, 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 Cam in a pizzeria. Uh, Cam says, you know, commercial lease rates are going to need a major adjustment moving forward. If things are going to bounce back, is that something, do you, do you take kind of a hands-off approach when it comes to, staying i mean kind of your job is to get involved in the business but i would imagine also like you know you're, you're not a governing body you're an advocacy group but but like there are also probably areas where you'd say well we should kind of stay out of business um with regards to commercial lease rates uh, i know for a fact that many people i mean people are thanking their lucky stars if they're up for renewal right now because i think if you're I mean, if, if, if you're the one that has the opportunity to leave or stay, you, you hold a lot of power right now in a new economic reality. I, I, I feel for the people that own the buildings or represent the owners that are trying to figure out the best way forward. This pandemic has been a massive disruption to everything. How do you approach that? I mean, do you approach that from observer status or are you advocating for how, how do you factor into that? Yeah, it's a good question. Like you're right that in, for the most part, I think we'll stay out of that generally speaking, because, you know, the market will determine what the rate is that makes sense. We've already seen, I think, a little bit of a dip for sure. Uh, again, not as much as Calgary, but um, 
I think, you know, what our role is when it comes to that kind of thing is you know, we've got a, a subcommittee of our board, our business recruitment and retention committee. And, and so having conversations with um, both sides of that equation. So always keeping our ears open to the, the real estate community and the development community to find out where they're at and what their needs and priorities are, what they're seeing. Um, and then to hear from our business community about what the barriers potentially are to them either coming downtown if they're looking for a move or what might be making them consider leaving downtown and just kind of trying to be that hub in the middle of all that and, and keeping communication clear and open and um, coming up with creative ideas in some cases um, to help with incentives and other things that might uh, make downtown leases a little bit more viable for folks. So, yeah, but we're, we're pretty hands off. I, I don't think we're going to have any kind of influence on lease rates, but obviously all conversations are relevant. Yeah. And, and, and to be quite honest, it would almost, I think, be counterproductive in, in the sense that you're representing the people that are doing business in the offices and, you, and you're also representing the people that own the towers. Right. I mean, both of them technically have an interest in downtown business. As do you. This is a great point from Marilyn, who's watching this morning. Marilyn says this is a really great conversation. Downtown isn't only business. And this may seem obvious, but let's point it out. She makes an important point. She says a lot of us live here, right? A vibrant restaurant and shopping and recreation scene is important. You know, I look forward to making sure that this continues that from Marilyn. Um, Punita, I just, before we go, Chris is tuned in this morning. He just wanted to compliment you. I hope I pronounced the last name correctly. Is it Raymond Bisinger or Bisinger, the print behind you? Uh, Chris is, is marveling at that. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about that or where you found it? That's, that's, that's a very cool kind of a grid piece, isn't it? Oh, I love it. I just bought it over the holidays, actually, through the Royal Bison's on-site online store. They did a boxing day or boxing week, uh, sale, which was really exciting, um, and so, yeah, he, I don't think he lives in Edmonton anymore, sadly, but, uh, it's a piece that is an illustration of the day was July 1st, 1983. So all the individual buildings that he's drawn in, uh, it's sort of a, a great sort of sketch and, and snapshot of Edmonton on that day. Um, and I think he says he spent, it was like 12 full days in the studio, just drawing each of these, wow. um, building so yeah it's a really cool piece and I, I can't help myself everything comes back to hockey I, th th that, that was the city right before the run of cops so there you go hey panita i knew we were gonna have fun i mean i i don't even we could bring you on and talk about whatever um i'm i'm, I'm proud of you i'm excited for you in this new role i know a lot of people um and i don't mean to heat pressure on you but a lot of people know that you're gonna that you're gonna do a really great job at a time when quite frankly downtown needs strong leadership and vision congratulations on the new gig thanks for making time for us here on real talk and, and we'll speak with you again soon Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. And anytime you got it, I've That's... got opinions on, on all kinds of things. <laughs> Is anytime. there anything, anything else you want to uh, offer us a hot take on before you go? <laughs> Nope, no, that'll be it for you're, today. You're, you're good. Okay. <laughs> That's Panita McBrien. She's executive director of the Downtown Business Association of Edmonton. Um, this has been fascinating. Have you been keeping an eye? I know you, it's a rhetorical question. I know you've been keeping an eye on the YouTube comments, but it's really, there's two conversations going on right now. Number one, what's the best people have not stopped talking about Dairy Queen. And number two, they're on to tacos now. Oh, they're on to tacos. Okay. I haven't checked for five minutes. So, um, but talking about work habits and, and commercial leases and work working from home and and there seems to be a mix like like several folks are saying I can't wait to get back in the office and others are saying I don't ever want to go back you know and it, it, it's it, I, I'd be curious to, I would I would suggest that employers are probably and again it may be on a case-by-case -case basis but some employers are probably quite eager to get their employees back and I would imagine some employers are probably going like Justin Archer that was talking there um, you know they're paying for you know, 15,000 square feet downtown, and maybe they're realizing they need five, you know, or 2,000 square feet and everybody can work from home. I, yeah. I'm going to be curious to see, like, like we won't know, Sam, in, in, like two or three or five years from now, ultimately what, what the rebound looked like if there was one. I, yeah, I don't, um, down, like, the funny thing is going into the pandemic, downtown was already kind of in this period of transformation. Yeah. Um. I can speak a little bit personally to it that I've always found like downtown. I used to work downtown. I used to take the bus to work every day and sometimes ride my bike. And it was 
refreshing to live in Inglewood, West Mount area and not have to drive to the office every day. That was actually quite a wonderful sort of relaxing part of my day that, that I looked forward to. Um, but then I also thought about weird things like, you know, if I wanted to say, get groceries on my way home, I had to go home, get off the bus, get in my car and go to the grocery store. Like it just felt wildly inefficient and i think we need this this vibrant downtown environment i love the energy of being downtown when events are happening i loved the energy of just being downtown on a daily basis and and working out of an office where i could just sort of walk around i love when i go to another city staying in a dense downtown core and and being able to just walk everywhere oh yeah edmonton is kind of on the road to that but it's you know uh, for every for every you know group of people that just champions this vibrant density sort of work live environment, there's also somebody that would see me riding my bike and yell out of their lifted truck to 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 give them their road back. Sure, yeah, I like it, and we'll have people watch. And we'll yeah. have people watching from from Calgary and Vancouver and and Toronto and Montreal and every city has a, a different downtown story. Like downtown Toronto, are you kidding me? Downtown Vancouver, even downtown yeah. Calgary to a certain degree that like, you know, the city that I grew up in is it, it's, it's demonstrably different. Um, and I think that we're still seeing impacts. Um, no, no, maybe the tide is turning back a little bit, but, but when West Edmonton mall, the biggest mall in the world was built in the 1980s, it, it killed Edmonton's downtown. It, it annihilated it. And, and, Cities across the board in the 80s became very suburban. Like Edmonton was yeah. was not an outlier on that. You know what I mean? Like, no, that's like downtown fair. was kind of shuttered for a bit here. The Hotel Mac was boarded up in the 80s. That's like that's unfathomable to me. Yeah. Yeah, that's wild to think about. Hope uh is watching this morning. Is this Hope? I mean this is a I'm respectfully I'm asking is your real name Hope Springs? That's I sincerely a, hope so. That is a beautiful name. Hope Springs? That's a beautiful name. That 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 I, I also envision like a like a, a, a Palm Springs golf course. Hope Springs. I, I would buy a membership there if I could afford it. Hope says Manulife and Commerce Place are absolutely dire. It says they were before the pandemic, though. I was working downtown. I love downtown, but I'm sad to see all the big anchor losses. If you're outside Edmonton, you may not be paying attention to the story, but it's like all the big anchor tenants are leaving. I mean, like, like leave, losing Holt Renfrew uh, for City Center Mall in downtown was, was, a, was a kick in the teeth because it's not just losing a massive anchor tenant, but it's also the message that it sends. And you look at how... You know, I mean, the work that big malls are having to do right now to keep their tenants. Uh, I mean, man, oh, man, um, this, the conversations going on here are amazing. So this is great. Uh, John says, you know, fine grain, small business space at a more affordable lease rate is essential to a downtown's retail success. Um, others, many of you are talking about transit downtown, which is huge, obviously. So um, keep the conversation going. He- yeah, Heather says affordability is what kept me out of downtown. Uh, for the for, for the price or in my price range, you got a great place in Sherwood Park. It's like twenty minutes outside of Edmonton, fifteen minutes actually, with a lot of close services. Maybe it's ten minutes. Sherwood Park's not too far. Um, she says in Edmonton, you know, the equivalent price was grim. We have one vehicle. Says Heather, we're making it work. So, so there you go. Uh, Lackey wonders, what about the effects of COVID on the demand for residential condo buildings? Those liver, living arrangements are higher risk environments. I wonder if people will be more reluctant to invest in condos now. That's an interesting thought. I don't, I, I suspect no, but you never know. I mean, we haven't, have we really heard about, we've heard about outbreaks at, at, um, you know, communal living, you know, like long-term care centers, which we're going to be focusing on next week. I also wanted to touch on something. My brain sometimes has these little flickers where I go, I better mention it now in case I forget. I saw, if you've been with us since the eight o'clock hour, thanks for sticking around. Uh, several of you were asking about a mental health panel. You said you'd like us to, I want to let you know that's coming early next week. It's going to be either Monday or Tuesday of next week. We're working on it. Uh, we're getting panelists together and working on it. That is coming up. So we're looking forward to that. I haven't heard of a lot of outbreaks. I'm not to say that haven't it hasn't happened and i'm not to say maybe i don't miss the odd news story but outbreaks in condo towers it is that a thing i, I haven't, haven't heard much either i think not to it, say it hasn't yeah, happened it but probably, i mean i'm sure it's happened but you got to look at scale right i mean there's condo towers you know maybe in 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 a city full of condo towers there's there's one or two sure, isolated maybe. cases compared to our long-term care homes or the workplaces that are having outbreaks or like I think there's bigger priorities. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and do I even want to click? I'm going to do this live. 
do I even want to find out why Joe Exotic is trending oh, on Twitter? Did he get pardoned? Did the president? Okay, let's find out in real time. Joe Exotic is trending. Joe Exotic's team telling the New York Post they have a limo and a beauty crew ready for his presidential pardon. Reporting Paris Jones for Coco 5. That's KOCO 5 News. Uh, where's chaos? Where is Paris reporting out of? Let's find out here. Oklahoma city, Oklahoma reporting. Uh, he says, I'm told, see, this is why we need to get NDI going so I can show you what's on my screen right now. Um, he says, I'm told he shows a picture of what, what appears to be a Dodge Ram one ton stretch limo. This is actually one of the coolest limos I've ever seen in my life. Um, he's got roll bars and everything. Uh, a Dodge Ram 3,500 limo says, I'm told this is the limo that will be waiting to pick up Joe Exotic if he receives the pardon tomorrow. The lead advocate, this is a serious news tweet. The lead advocate of Team Tiger tells me they'll be taking him to a secure location. Joe doesn't want anyone to see him until his hair is done. (laughs) I was hoping we were all collectively done with Joe Exotic. We had a lot of fun at the beginning of the pandemic. I, uh, okay. So this is not, so as far as we can tell, um, Aaron meantime tweeting in and says, if he doesn't pardon Joe exotic, I say impeach him a third time. Um, so, so on the list of rumored pardons, we have Joe exotic and Lil Wayne. Uh, it's rumored that Lil Wayne is going to be pardoned for a handgun possession, uh, uh, dust a, a little, little flare up on the radar. Do you uh, think he's treating this like The Apprentice? Like, do you think he gets everybody that wants to be pardoned in a boardroom and then just takes shots at them and decides? Who well, I think he's. Do? I think he's probably trying to figure out what's best for him. Oh, we're talking. Of we're talking about President Trump. What's best for him moving forward? So I think the pardons will be uh, narcissistic, self serving. Uh, you know, selfish. Uh, I, I just can't wrap my mind. The idea of presidential pardons. Period. Like this is it's if you actually think about it, which I have been doing, it's 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 like you're saying you and and in this particular circumstance, it's one thing like if a president's leaving, they serve two terms and they can't run again and on their way out, they're going to do a few favors. And I mean, I even think that's wild. I even think that is is. I'm going to sound like I'm like my like I'm, I'm like a school marm, but like it's it's I think it's very inappropriate. I think it's extremely inappropriate, but especially when you have a president leaving office that that could wind up in jail. This guy could be wearing the silver bracelets, trading in all his gold down the line. A guy that essentially orchestrated a terrorist attack on his own government buildings, attacked his own democracy, is refusing to respect the results of his country's election as the commander in chief and is now allowed to pardon like a hundred people before he leaves in disgrace. Like I I know I'm not the only one that's just gobsmacked by this. And you're going to say, and you're going to write in and you're not going to be wrong. And you're going to say, well, Ryan, what do you expect them to do? You expect them to just like tear up all the, you, I mean, I guess to a certain degree, kind of, sort of. Yeah, I know they can't, but it's just to me, it's, it's nuts. You know, what's not nuts is taking this time of year to reimagine what your front or backyard living space might look like. Don't settle for what the builders gave you. That lousy bit of loam, it's not It's not even set up properly. Drainage is a disaster on your property. And oh, thanks for the one poplar tree. Forget about it. Eden Landscaping right now knows that this is the time of year that you're going to start your planning, and they want to be a part of that, whether it's something small like a like a planter's box all the way up to a total yard overhaul. Like you want waterfalls and, you know, all kinds of, I mean, they can do it all. And right now they're using tools like Zoom and even Google Earth to make sure that they can respect all protocols while they work together with you. You can find them online. Just check out the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. That's also where you're going to find the team at Local Waste. Now, they're looking to expand their business to communities in Alberta and neighboring provinces where maybe there's a void. Maybe there's a bit of an interruption in delivery for small, medium, and large businesses. That's the game that Local Waste has been in for more than a quarter century. Locally owned right here. uh, Families out of Edmonton. And Chris and Lauren Labossier want your call they want to compete for your business 
and they love talking trash. So give them a shout at 780-242-9746. We also wanted to give a shout out to the team at Alta Moving and Storage. We know that this is the time of year that a lot of you are following up on these, I know, I am going to say it, resolutions. You have resolved that your 2021 is finally the time that you're going to address the clutter, finally the time that you're going to move out of the place that you've outgrown, or maybe you're going to downsize. Maybe the kids are gone. Maybe, I don't know, not making fun, just saying the reality Maybe COVID killed the marriage that was lousy from the beginning and you're excited about a fresh start, but it means a condo or an apartment instead of that house. Take the stress away from moving. You don't need that. These pod style containers that they've got makes moving easy. They can supply the movers or you can do the work yourself. And if you need short or long-term storage, in other words, you don't know what you're going to quite do yet with that piano or your hockey cards, or I don't know why I thought of stinky hockey gear, but Maybe short-term or long-term storage on the stinky hockey gear is a good call. That could maybe save your marriage. I don't want to take it out of storage once it's been stored, though. Fair enough. Alta Moving and Storage has, has, has not instructed us to set them up as marriage counselors, but you could improve your relationship. Check them out online at altastorage.ca. So there we have it. Tomorrow's going to be a great show. Let me let me tee up what's coming up tomorrow because I'm super excited about this. We know that there's a lot in the news that can really get you down and kind of, well, I don't want to say kill your spirit because I know you're strong and resilient folks, but sometimes we need a reminder that things are pretty great. Sometimes we need some encouragement. And so tomorrow we're going to introduce two gentlemen, uh, as a matter of fact, three of them, two of them are brothers, one saved the other's life, literally. Uh, but we're going to introduce you to two fellas that are probably, I think they would agree, lucky to be alive. Two different stories, stories of recovery and rebuild. And uh, I just know you're going to love hearing from Jonathan Ferguson and Christian Zip. That's coming up on Wednesday's show. We're also going to offer you comprehensive coverage of the presidential inauguration. We'll hit that out of the gates on Wednesday's Real Talk. In the meantime, tell everybody about today's show, and we'll talk to you soon.